Chinese art law, Kyle Taklal Singh and Stefan Ramkisun, together with several members of the legal profession, as they discuss how we got here and the way forward. A crop of confidence in the legal profession. Tuesday, 12th July at 7 p.m. A special edition of Section 1, live on radio and TV Jagati. What you need to know, it's your business. As the world's economy evolves, what you need to know, it's your business. Keeping an eye on business and informing you on its happenings, it's our business. Eye on business on radio and TV Jagrity, weekdays at 9 a.m. Bonnie Sakai inviting you to be a part of my television sensation, Bollywood's Best on TNT's Best TV Jaggedy. Tune in every Sunday morning from 10 to 11 as together we count down the top 10 biggest and best Bollywood videos of the week, check out the latest movie previews and of course what's trending with your favorite Bollywood celebrities. It's the only of its kind on national television, so don't miss it. Bollywood's best every Sunday morning from 10 to 11, exclusive to TV Jackety. A crisis of confidence in the legal profession. Sitaram to you, our listeners of Radio Jagati, 102.7 FM and our viewers on TV Jagati. Trinidad and Tobago is facing a crisis in the legal profession. Join attorneys at law Kyle Taklal Singh and Stefan Ramkisun together with several members of the legal profession as they discuss how we got here and the way forward. A crisis of confidence in the legal profession. Tuesday, 12th July at 7 p.m. A special edition of Section 1, live on radio and TV Jagati. आपका धर्म आपका स्टेशन टीवी जागृति Welcome to Section 1 on a very special program of Section 1 today with your host Stefan Ramkisun. Kyle Taklal Singh. As the, the new introduction showed, is a, I mean this is a this is a new, this is a special program that we had that we that we forgive forgive we have a little technical difficulty there, but but um we have a, is a new program, a crisis in legal a crisis of confidence yeah, in legal. Special profession. edition to deal with I think everybody in the population. Um, and I think all of our viewers have been hearing about the issue with the Attorney General, whether yeah. or not he has been forthright with a court in Miami, whether or not um, the public continues to have <laughs> confidence, whether or not the legal profession has lost confidence in the Attorney General, yeah. and in turn, whether or not the public has lost confidence in the legal profession, because yeah. the Attorney General is considered to be <coughs> the titular head of the bar. By yeah. that, I mean the representative head of the bar, the ceremonial head of the bar, Correct. meaning he's essentially the leader of all lawyers in the country, and therefore, if he is impeached and confidence is lost in him, there's a ripple down effect. Yeah, and, 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 this, and this is stemming from, of course, um, for those of you um, who are not in the legal profession, there is a, there is a vote of confidence, essentially. A vote special, of no confidence. A vote of no confidence on, um, on Friday the 15th. Mm -hmm. the, um, the law association is having a special meeting mm -hmm. to have this vote of no confidence. Yes. Um, so whether, just, or not, whether or not um, it, it happens or not, it's, it's up to the legal profession to come yeah, out and, uh, and do what they need so, to do. So, so what has happened there is that once you are a lawyer, you become a member of the law association. And under the rules of the law association, 
you have special general meetings. Well, you have general meetings and special general meetings. <coughs> the law association is set up by a statute. Yeah. Part of the objects of the statute and part of the objects of the law association is to maintain and to preserve the rule of law and to protect the rule of law. To and protect, the confidence of the legal profession. And the confidence of the legal profession and to protect the administration of justice. Yeah, correct. And therefore, when members of the law association, meaning lawyers, have issues that they wish to highlight and wish to discuss, they are entitled to call for a special meeting to have a discussion mm -hmm. and to pass motions, um, either condemning something or supporting something. And yeah. you've seen that in the past. Many years ago, in 2009, there was a no confidence motion in then Attorney General um, John Jeremy. John Jeremy yeah. um, more recently, there was a, a confidence a vote of no confidence or a vote to deal with certain with respect to the Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, several members <coughs> um, of the Law Association and lawyers, both Stefan and I signed that petition, one yep. of 40 who signed the petition to call for the special meeting. It's to be held on Friday. And lawyers will then express their views on this issue concerning the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, Stefan, all of us, I think all attorneys are more or less familiar with the facts. Mm -hmm. This show is really designed to assist and help the public yeah. um, understand what are the issues at play at this meeting because you might just wake up on Saturday morning and read a um, mm -hmm. motion either yay or nay yeah. and you don't and know you, well, you, what this is about etc. Yeah. And yeah. we feel that the public needs to really be sensitized yeah. as to the fact and we're going to break it down for you to the very core facts and as yeah. Stefan will go through some of the facts it's essentially an easy timeline to understand. Yeah, correct. Um, and let me just quickly the Attorney General he was once the lawyer for certain people, Ms. Mr. Brian Quaitong, Mr. René Peer, he became Attorney General many years later. There were proceedings in Miami. Uh, a, a motion was filed for him to disqualify himself because he was previously the Attorney General, um, previously the lawyer for these people. He swore to an affidavit and some of the representations in that affidavit Try to picture that his role in those previous proceedings we'll, were we'll very get, minimal. I think we'll get down to the to the to the nitty gritty, nitty -gritty. so that everybody understands. Because some people may be wondering, well, what was wrong with this? And what's wrong? And then yeah. we'll break it down. Yeah. And so the, the show is not only designed to let everyone who may not be quite accurate with the facts understand what is going on. We also have now the views of certain lawyers who will be coming onto the show, mm -hmm. and well. None other than um, Mr. Anand Biharal, Queen's we'll see, Council. Yeah, Mr. Anand Biharal, Queen's will, Council. He's very lucky to have him. We are very lucky to have him. We um we he's stole actually him. in in today. We stole him from um a vacation, but yeah, we, so we, be we, it. we apologize. When, but when, at when the end of the day, some things are some things are, are, are very important. And and um as Mr. Biharal will, will will come and he will discuss his views mm -hmm. on the the AG. We have I mean to have someone that experience as a Queen's Council sitting here. I, it, we, we are privileged to have him here in studio. Um, we also have a, a variety of lawyers, um, Mr. Sean Sobers, Mr. Sean Mahis, um, Ms. Candice Barrett, and so on and so forth. We keep going with Mr. Sacharia. Yeah. So we have a lot of lawyers coming on um, to discuss their views and discuss what they think about the, the situation. So, it's, so you will not only be hearing from Kyle, myself, and Mr. Bihari, Lal Queen's Council. You will also be hearing from other members of the Law Association and what their hopefully, view is on Hopefully this. you hear from us very little and you hear from them much more. And I think right? that, is the, I think I that think, is the idea. And then we'll try to, we'll try to open the lines at the end of the program to yeah. get your views on the matter. We'll definitely, I mean, we'll definitely how we, how we designed it, I think we should have a, at least 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, hopefully, yeah. to have your views on there. So the, the program is really scheduled for about two hours, seven to nine. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you stay with us for long and stay with us for the entire thing because from around 8.30 to 8.40, we're going to take your calls to hear what you think about the situation, having listened to everything that Kyle and I have said. So as, as we said, this is a very important issue. And I think, um, so I think, I first, think Kyle could go into step, it a little bit. The first step with all, um, as with all legal proceedings, all good pleadings, all good stories, um, you essentially need to discuss the facts yeah and i think what we'll do is take a short break and yeah. come back and stefan will get into the facts yeah
What's you need to know? It's your business. As the world's economy evolves, what's you need to know? It's your business. Keeping an eye on business and informing you on its happenings, it's our business. Eye on business on radio and TV Jagrati, weekdays at 9 a.m. So welcome back to section one. I think, I think as Kyle said, with anything, it's important to now discuss the facts first. Mm -hmm. And I think where we start, Kyle, is really and truly, um, Mr. Moore, we start in, in the past where Mr. Moore used to represent Mr. Bar Brian Quaitong and Rene Peer in matters involving the charges. And he then... Well, um, it's, imp it's interesting you said Mr. Moore because actually at that time, Mr. Amore... SC, SC yeah, which well, we will see <laughs> will become very important. So that, is, and that, is, and that, is, and that is true. SC being senior counsel, yes, right? So yes. it becomes very important later in the story. Yes, correct. But as, as Stefan was saying, he, Mr. Amor was the lawyer for Mr. Brian Quaiton and Ms. Rennie Peer in certain proceedings in Trinidad. But well, charges brought against the police, he represented them um, mm. in the courts. Brought by right? the police brought against by the police. So, so the police brought certain charges against Mr. Mr. Quaiton and Ms. Peer. And Mr. Moore, senior counsel, represented them in the courts. Um, and, below. and it's not just, just to add, it's not just any proceedings. It was one of the biggest yeah. criminal cases, I think, by anybody's standards. Mm -hmm. It was one of the biggest, most prominent criminal cases in the country. Yeah. It involved, everybody has heard about the Piaco corruption, alleged Piaco corruption Correct. scandal, al allegations allegedly made mm -hmm. um, in relation to Piaco 1. Yep. And Mr. Amor Essie was senior counsel mm -hmm. in 2003 when he was representing Mr. Miss, 2003, 2004, yeah, yeah, yeah. when Ms. he was Peer representing Miss Peer and Mr. Quaitong. And that is the first fact that we all need to understand. Yeah. Mr. Moore represented, he was their lawyer, he was yep. their confidant. These people went to him, they trusted him, they retained mm -hmm. him, and he represented them. And as, as you know, it's important to say, any lawyer worth his salt before you get into resenting anybody. Yeah. The first thing you have to do is take instructions. <laughs> take instructions. You Correct. have to take instructions. You have to speak to your client. Mm -hmm. It is even, I mean, I don't want to offend the civil lawyers out there. We are civil lawyers. But it is perhaps even more important in yeah. criminal to cases, take, to take in my experience, to yeah. take very detailed yeah. instructions. And yeah. oftentimes, what clients tell you in the process of taking instructions in a criminal case mm -hmm. is very important and constitutes privilege. Yeah, well, correct. regardless of it's civil or criminal, but the privilege, it, it the, privilege the protection yeah. correct. of what correct. is told to you is takes on even more importance and, and in a criminal in a case. case. And, 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 and as Kyle said, especially in a case such as this, which was at that time, it was it was huge. Everyone knew about it. Yeah. Every everyone down to little kids were learning about it because it, it, it was the biggest thing in China at that but time. That anytime anybody visited the airport, you had a question. You had in your a mind. question in your yeah. mind. That's the point. At that yeah. time, yeah. it was always it was the alleged corruption. Yeah. Um, these people were charged. X was charged. Y was charged. And these charges were brought. And Mr. Moore, senior counsel, represented these two individuals. And I just want to emphasize again because I think it's also an important issue in the story. What you tell your lawyer who represents you in criminal proceedings, we're all mm -hmm. innocent until proven guilty. And if you find yourself charged, yeah. you have to have the confidence to tell your lawyer everything. Mm -hmm. And he must understand everything in order for him to properly advise you and yeah. defend you competently. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, moving on to that, let's fast forward a little bit. As we mm -hmm. know, um, Mr. Moore was then recently appointed as the Attorney General. Well, just prior to that, you also have to say, you're, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. But... Parallel to these proceedings in Trinidad. Yes, there was the, the, the matter in, in, in um Proceedings in Miami, were instituted in Miami, in Dade County, yes. by the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, correct. And various defendants, mm -hmm. Bill Hook, um, Burke Burke, 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 Burke Hillman Burke consultants. Hillman, right, a consultant, and Mr. Um, Quaitong, Quaitong yes. who is a defendant there. And therefore, the, they were facing proceedings not only in Trinidad, but, but also in, in Miami. And, right? and, and, and important stemming from that. 
when the Republic of Toronto Tobago brings cases in, in for example, Miami-Dade County, yeah. the representative, the legal representative, is that of the Attorney General. It's constitutional. It, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so since then, we have had many Attorney Generals coming yes. in, Mr. Anuram Luga, Mr. Faris Alwari, now Mr. Reginald Amor, mm -hmm. Senior Counsel. And you had many different people representing, many different Attorney Generals representing the state of Trinidad and Tobago in this case. Yes. So now we get to the point of Mr. Amor being appointed in one of the most prestigious positions that yes. there is in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Ra, we are sacked. Oh, sorry. Well, let's well, we'll we'll get into it now. We'll get into it. He's not Mr. Ra, Ra. we tonight, right? It's not, this, this is yeah. not about, this yeah. is not, yeah. not about yeah. Faris or yeah. Mr. Ra, yeah. the former Attorney yeah. General. Yeah. No, right. this is really squarely on our yeah. Mr. Amor right. Senior Counsel. Yeah. And he was appointed um, senior counsel. Um, he attorney was appointed general. attorney general. Right. Now we have he. We have now an affidavit. I want to bring up on the screen if right. we can. If um. Well, hold. So. So. So now we have this, right? Right. So we have this. But just before we get into this, the affidavit. What occurs? What is very important to understand? When Mr. Amor is appointed mm -hmm. as attorney general, there is a motion to disqualify that is filed. Yes, and correct. You, you could understand the basis. Yes. Essentially, what is taking place is that his former client is saying, "Hey, that's my lawyer. That was yeah. my lawyer. Why is he, why is he consulting um, with lawyers against me? Mm -hmm. I have, I may have told him things that were very privileged. Yes, I don't want him using that against me. He is yes. my lawyer. He's the person I trusted. Exactly. And therefore, I have a complaint in him." being the representative of the state of Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. against me. So, and I right. file a motion of disqualification. Yeah. What then occurs is that Mr. Amor files this affidavit. Yes. You see it there. So this it's is in response to a motion brought by the defendants to yes. disqualify not only um, mm -hmm. the Attorney General, uh, Mr. Reginald Amor, but also Sequa Law. Sequa Law is a firm of lawyers who is representing the Attorney General yes. and Trinidad, the state, the of, state Trinidad of Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago. Correct. in Miami. Yes. Right, and this is the affidavit. So you this see is there? this is an this is an affidavit sworn in the proceedings. And by I want, Mr. and Moore. the first line is important, Stefan. Read that yeah. first line. My well, I original of lawful age and under the penalty of perjury, declare as follows. Right. So he's essentially attesting to this affidavit. Yes. That it will be truthful, and he's saying that under penalty of perjury, yes. I declare as follows, and that's, that's very important. Yeah. Right. And I want to. I want to Get one and two are important, but the main paragraph I want to get into, and for everyone to, to look at it is paragraph three. Can we get it a little We can get bigger? a larger, um, Josh? A little larger, three, yeah. Just bring just it up. A just, just a right. touch. I, that, that's perfect. That's perfect. perfect. Yeah. So I want to read it out for you guys. So this is paragraph three of the sworn affidavit of Mr. Moore, Senior Counsel. Mm -hmm. For what I recall as being a few years at the start of the preliminary inquiry, next referred to. So let's stop there for a second. Let's break it down. He is referring to the preliminary inquiry, which was the air, the preliminary inquiry into criminal charges Brought arising from against, the airport, yes. the, the Piaco issue in Trinidad in 2003 and 2004. Yeah. So he is saying, he's introducing this paragraph by saying, for what I recall, he's talking about what he recalls from memory mm -hmm. as to his role in this preliminary inquiry. Correct. And that's how we go. Correct. So let's go from this there. Is, and this is where it gets a little bit um, yeah. a dicey, to, for want of a better term. Yeah. I worked as a junior lawyer to leading senior counsel lawyer, Alan Alexander, senior counsel, now deceased. Right. At the time, representing defendant Brian Quaitong and his girlfriend, Renee Peer, in a preliminary inquiry in criminal proceedings in the Port of Spain Magistrates Court of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago concerning the criminal case brought against him for his alleged role in the planning, and just go down for everyone to see construction and maintenance of the Piaco International Airport. So hold there, hold there, right? Before we go on. So he says here, he essentially says here that he worked as a junior lawyer. Yep. Now remember, when you're an, when you're on a when you are giving evidence on behalf of the state, mm -hmm. in fact anybody giving evidence to a court, they have a duty to be forthright with the court. Yep. There are no half truths. You can't be dishonest with a court and that applies a hundred times, a hundred million times when you are the general because you are giving evidence on behalf of the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Correct. He is giving evidence on behalf of each and every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. He is your and, legal representative in Miami. He and therefore the when correct and therefore when he says that he was a junior attorney mm -hmm. working for or, or being, led, being led that has to be scrutinized especially in the context 
where in those proceedings he is listed as senior counsel, appearing yeah. as senior counsel. And we'll get into it, you know, we'll get into his role just now. Yeah, yeah. We'll get it because, so go because on. funny enough, but, but finally, and this is the last line, mm -hmm. my role as a junior lawyer was limited to minimal legal research and to taking notes in the early years of the preliminary inquiry to assist my leader, Mr. Alexander S.C. These are the words of the Attorney General. Sworn under pain of perjury, he has said three material things. Three material things. Yep. First, junior counsel. Ju Sec junior lawyer being led by. Yeah, so that's a serious right. thing. Junior. He was junior in the proceedings. Yep. Second, he did minimal legal research. And third, all he did was to take, take notes. notes. Right? Take notes. And that was it. And those are the three things you have to extrapolate from his sworn evidence yeah. to a court of law in Miami mm -hmm. on behalf of the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Yep. Those are the three facts you have I'll, to pull out from. I hope Ole taking notes because when Ole get all that opportunity well, to call him. Careful what you're taking, saying taking notes. Well, you're aware. Yeah, right. yeah, because I'm I never said on the fate of perjury that right. I, that my, my thing is so only notes taken. So let's go on. But the, let's go on. The the, the, the the circuit court now in Miami did decide to make a decision now on this. Makes so there was a ruling. motion. Yeah. There was a motion. There was an affidavit in response as we just read there out. There was a hearing. Paragraph. There was a hearing. Mm. And now, Josh pull it up. There was a ruling by the judges, right? So as you can see, this is not me and Kyle talking here. We go scroll down throughout the entire thing. This is the order of the court in Miami Dade County, yeah. right? And, and I want to get down. I want to get down to the last paragraph. Just yes, go up a little bit, yeah. Right. So these are so just just pull it up a little bit bigger, so everyone perfect. So so this is the decision now of the court in Miami Dade County for the re for these reasons and the reasons set forth at the hearing held. On April the 27th, Kyle just said there was a hearing. Mm -hmm. The court grants defendants, Quiton and Ferguson's, motions to disqualify Mr. Amor uh, uh, and Sequa Law as the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago's counsel. One second. So before we go on there, before we go on there, you would recall, and we don't want to make this too political, that there was some issue where the Prime Minister said in a press conference, he said, well, no, 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 Mr. I was not um, disqualified. He, he recused disqualified, himself. Yeah. Well, you know, with all due respect to the Honorable These are the words Minister, of the court. We are dealing with the facts from yes. a court order, which is not disputed as far as I am aware. Yeah. And it clearly says that Mr. Amor is disqualified. The order grants disqualified. Could you just go back up a little bit, Josh? There's one paragraph I wanted to raise. Go down. Yeah, keep going up. Is this one not the parallel? Mm. All, right, no, all right. That's okay. So, yeah, that's fine. Let's go straight back down. Yeah, go straight back down. <coughs> so, we'll continue Stop. reading for everyone. Yeah. Stop there. No, go back up one paragraph. And, I, and, and, and this is important because this also applies in Trinidad and Tobago. It's not expressed the same way because there are different provisions, but it also applies. The Florida Rules of Professional Responsibility expressly prohibit an attorney from serving as counsel on behalf of a client who is directly adverse to a former client in the same or substantially similar proceedings. So this is the basis upon which the court in America makes a ruling because there is a rule of law in America and it's equal here in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Commonwealth essentially that attorney at law should not act against his former, his former client. It expressly prohibits an attorney from serving as counsel on behalf of a client who is directly adverse to a former client in the same or substantially similar proceedings. The provision specifically applies to lawyers currently serving in government um, positions, right? And 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 so essentially, you could you could take it on a dash. No, we could go. We had to finish. Oh, sorry. Um, let, the order, let's yeah. finish the order. So we have there now the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago has shall have twenty days on the order, and, and and they had it right. The yes. court makes no findings of misconduct by sequa law, and shall have thirty days of this order to obtain the <laughs> counsel. So mm -hmm. essentially, now you see from the order that Mr. Amor and sequa law was disqualified. Yes. As as Republic, and you can come back to us now, Josh. Right, and then we go now. We have, in relation to all of these things, allegations flying throughout. You have Mr. Amor making certain press statements. Yeah. And one of the more important press statements, I don't know if we have it, Josh. Um, but I, I'm not certain. But I could, but we could read it out. Um, the one on June the twentieth, twenty twenty-two. Yeah. I'm not sure if 
if we have it, we sent it off, but I'm not sure if we have it there. That's fine. We right? can read it. So this is what in the response to the public allegations, Mr. Moore said that in the Miami court, he, he published a press statement on the on the twentieth of June twenty twenty two. Now, what he said is this. I therefore had to rely entirely on my memory. He's talking about the Kanju. As I said in the affidavit, which I signed, I did not recollect any details of my representation of Mr. Kwaitong. To the best of my recollection, at that time, I had acted as junior counsel to Mr. Alan Alexander SC and had primarily done research and taken notes on Mr. Kwaitong's defense. That is, what I, that is what I did. That is what I said. So and he confirms. He confirmed that. He confirms his affidavit. Recap. Mr. Moore, previous lawyer, preliminary inquiry in Trinidad 2003 2004. Proceedings are instituted in Miami against Mr. Kwaitong, his former client. He is now appointed Attorney General. He then is cast with the constitutional responsibility to take proceedings against his former client. A motion to disqualify him yeah. because you are not, because of a rule which applies throughout the legal world as far as I'm aware. A motion to disqualify is filed on the basis that a lawyer ought not to act against their, their, their client, their previous client. Yeah. In response to that, and that is a normal motion, in response mm -hmm. to that, and this is where we really hone in on Mr. Amor with all due respect to him, his conduct. Yeah. He is tasked with filing an affidavit in response to that motion. Mm -hmm. You are expected to be truthful, honest, and forthright. Not only as a litigant, not only as a human being, not only as a citizen, but especially because you are the Attorney General yeah. of Trinidad and Tobago, a sovereign state who believes in the principles of democracy and sovereignty and the rule of law and everything that goes with that. And we expect you to be forthright and honest as an Attorney General. And you put up that affidavit where essentially the Attorney General says he was simply a note taker. Yeah. Right? And that is where we are in the story. And I now. think I think I, I think we all we can, we can move now on move because as as with any court proceedings, you have notes and evidence, you have you have these things where you, yeah. you have a transcript to show what happened in the cross examination. It's, it's for the attorneys, it's for the judges to, to mm -hmm. consider when they're making the decisions. And I think we could um we could we, we could we could go straight to the transcript, right? Because Mr. Biharil is waiting too yeah, long too in the long, um yes, yes. in the thing. We already have him out there. So just if we could go up to the to the slides. Yes. And we could go straight So this down. is essentially a pamphlet that has been done, <laughs> which we have noted, <laughs> and it accurately reflects some of the trans some of the extracts from the transcript, transcript yeah. of the proceedings where Mr. Amor was representing Kwaitang. So what you have to consider when you are reading these excerpts of him speaking and him giving su submissions, what you have to consider is whether or not he was simply playing the role of note taker, mm -hmm. minimal legal research, and junior attorney at law. So in his words, he did not have a significant role. So you could go down just keep, keep going um, so from paragraph, we have 11, right? So we could start reading now. Approximately 20 pages of transcript from page 27 to 48 show A.G. Amor, senior counsel, making lengthy and substantive submissions in relation to a so, search warrant. So one thing that happens sometimes in criminal proceedings, the police try to admit a search warrant into yeah. evidence to show <laughs> facts on the search warrant. <clears throat> according to this and according to the transcript, there were lengthy submissions, almost 20 pages. And when yes. you say 20 pages... This means 20 pages of recording him speaking yeah. or ex yeah. having exchanges with the magistrate mm -hmm. of submissions in relation to that search warrant. So we could go Is down Is that no taking? I, not, I think not. You be, right? From page 66 to page 74, AGMO senior counsel substantially responds to submissions made by the state's lawyers so, in relation to the issue of the so warrant. So what would have happened? Mr. Moore would have made submissions. The state's lawyer, and from my memory, Mr. Moore made submissions and several senior counsel there adopted his submissions. Yeah, correct. Instead of repeating it, the state responded to his submissions and then he was allowed, a rejoinder we call it, allowed, mm -hmm. but he was allowed to reply to those submissions. Yeah. Again, remember, remember, this is someone who did minimal, uh, it, was, it was not he significant. He said in his affidavit. He has said in his affidavit and then, he's, then he was just a note taker. He, he was a note taker and he did minimal research. Right. right? On page 86 of the transcript, AGMO senior counsel intervenes for the purpose of comparing disclosed documents. And what this is, what this is, is essentially the prosecution is trying to tender documents mm -hmm. into evidence. He, he intervenes for the purposes. He has been disclosed documents. Yeah. He wants to see if the documents he has been disclosed is the same as the documents mm -hmm. that are being tendered in evidence. 
in science. Yep. Right? On page 143, AGMO Senior Counsel intervenes to seek disclosure of the document being tendered. So a document is being tendered. Mr. Moore gets up in court and say, um, Your Worship, I want to see that document. I want it disclosed to me before it goes into court. Right? On page 183, AGMO Senior Counsel, in the case of Mr. Alexander, Senior Counsel, will not be appearing before the court and he continues to conduct the proceedings on behalf so of the So this is clients. important. So hold it. This is important. Mr. Amor indicates to the magistrate in that transcript that, remember in his affidavit, he said he was being led and he only played a junior role and he was a note taker mm -hmm. to Mr. Alexander S.C. But here he is on page 183 of the transcript, Mr. Amor saying that, he will, that, mis, that Mr. Alexander will not be appearing and then he continues the to conduct. conduct of the proceedings yeah. while things are active while documents are being tendered now seems all, like a note taker now me. with all due respect if i was a client yeah and i had someone to be a note taker yeah and i had someone to lead my case i would be very i would be very shocked yeah. if especially the note taker case, especially a case such as this this where i faced many years of imprisonment if found guilty if the note taker told the magistrate well the lawyer the leader the is lead, not going to be not gonna and it. i am going to handle it yeah. that that would be very um yeah let's go cavalier to <laughs> 27 2004 this is quote so you see the quotations there this is quoted from the transcript yeah. so on page 252 agmo senior council states as follows we certainly have no objection to the request made by mr martino and i speak for mr alexander i will be leading the defense for those who appear for the month of june mr alexander will not be here so here you have mr amor telling the court i will be leading the defense not, not, taking note, take not taking notes, not acting as junior counsel, not doing minimal research. I will be leading the defense. Very clear in my respectful view. Let's go, Josh. Yeah. And on page June 15, 2004, on page 272, AGMO <laughs> Senior Counsel makes the submissions on the duty of the state to be forthright. Uh, Interestingly, yeah, uh, states as follows. Yeah, go. Good luck, yeah. Good luck, Josh. It's very important, and I think this is because... <laughs> I told you that an attorney general is not an ordinary litigant. No. It is well known that an attorney general, when they conduct litigation, when you sue the state or if the state institutes proceedings, they have a special duty. They have a duty of candor and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the state has documents that an ordinary litigant does not have. And therefore, the law imposes on him a duty to be forthright with the court, a duty to have candor, and a duty to be very transparent. In, well, in a famous case, it was said that the state must conduct litigation with the cards face up. Okay, Mr. Moore agrees with you, you know. So, well, if we, if we, so let's, yeah, let's so, get into so Mr. Moore agrees with you. Yeah. This, is the words, this is the words of Mr. Senior Moore, Senior Counsel. Counsel says it better than me. Yes. As your worship is aware, and we are all aware, this is a serious responsibility with the state to play with its cards face up on the table. That is their responsibility because they are the state. They the are ministers, ministers of, of justice. justice. And the cards face up for the, the lawyers will know it comes from the famous Bakongo case, mm -hmm. right? Where you dealt with the duty of can, candor. But you see it very here. That is their responsibility because they are the state and they are ministers of justice. The state is not an ordinary litigant. That's the the point. state must be more forthright. And therefore, when the state brings litigation against a citizen in a foreign country, I also think here they are forthright. Yes, agree. On page 343 of the transcript, AGMO Senior Counsel, on behalf of his clients, mm -hmm. adopts the submissions made by Mr. Solomon, Senior Counsel. He states as follows. Your Worship, may I put on the record that we associate ourselves with the application made by Mr. Solomon and all the remarks by my other friends. It is not, to my knowledge, admissible or lawful for the prosecution to conduct a prosecution in secrecy. Well, first of all, I agree with that submission. Yeah, I, I agree too. You can't disagree but, with but, it. But it also goes again to the root of this issue. You have a duty to be forthright with the court and you yeah. ought to say everything and you ought not to keep things in secrecy. So if you played a more important role in tell these us. proceedings, you had a duty to tell the court. I mean, Correct. Right? On, so June the 30th, 2004, on this same date, stating at paragraph 385, of the transcript, AGMO Senior Counsel conducts extensive cross-examination. This cross-examination spans two days of proceedings and is recorded in almost 20 <laughs> pages of transcript. Yeah. Right? And as any more, Josh? So yeah, we have, this, we have is, the, this is the cross-examination. This, this is the, and this is the, this is, I think, the, the most, one of some of the most important well, parts of I, it. I think it's one of the more ironic things. I see well, it uh, ironically. Yeah. Right? Uh, let's, yeah. 
ironically and perhaps later with, with prescience. prescience. <laughs> it means foresight. I, whoever wrote AG, this, whoever yeah, yeah, had, the a, foresight, had, pension, yeah. had the foresight. Had the foresight. A G M R cross examines W P C corporal archery on the meaning of the word misrepresents. How ironic! Yeah. Right. Let's get into it. So we here he is. Wait, hold on. So here he is. <laughs> Cross-examining a senior police officer at that time, woman police constable, corporal, woman police officer, corporal, corporal Archie, Archie, on the meaning of the word misrepresent. misrepresent. What it is to misrepresent? Well, let me see. Right? Well, let me see. This is the words of, of, of the Honorable Attorney General. Yeah. We to adopt the AG's reasoning on the word. Well, this, on is, the this meaning. is commentary. So yeah, this is commentary. Yeah. So what constitutes misrepresentation before the law? Go, yeah. Let's go on. Let's see what he has to say. And I think so it will be is, correct. So this is the this is the AG. Cross-examining cross WPC. So this is his question in yes. leading form. Yes. And I think it will be a correct assumption on my part as a police officer that you would not, in the course of any of your investigations, misrepresent facts to a judge of a high court. Would you? So stop. So this is the attorney general put yeah. into the police. So you just imagine those of you who have been yeah. in court. A lawyer now is telling the police, well, and ma'am, I think it will be correct. It will be a correct assumption on my part as a... That as a police officer, you're not going to mislead any court. No. You're not going to mislead any court or high court in your investigation. Mm -mm. And the obvious reason you ask that is because the police officer is supposed to say no. Yeah. And and what she did. What she did. She said she said I would not do that. So no. Let's go. Right. And then this is Mr. Amo again. Right. <laughs> you would not. Just so that we are agreed on the meaning of the word misrepresent. I have the dictionary meaning of that word. That I'd like you to agree with me on. So I'm here, referring to the shorter Oxford English Dictionary. So here he is. Here we go. Here he is. Hold on. Here he is telling, telling the, well, just in case we're all confused. Yeah. Of what, what the meaning is. Misrepresent. Right? I mean, I, I, I think it's a clear word, but Mr. Well, Mr. 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 Moore, Senior Counsel, clearly, um, clearly wants to be very thorough in his cross-examination. Yes. Correct. And he wants to have references, and he has referenced the... The shorter Oxford, Oxford English, English Dictionary. Dictionary. So, let's go to the shorter Oxford English Dictionary. I have a copy. So, he has a copy. Has let's a copy, let's keep yeah. thinking. Volume 2. Edition. If you look in the third column, midway down, you ought to see there the word misrepresent, which says, to represent improperly or imperfectly to give a false account. Let's read it again. To represent improperly or imperfectly. Perfectly. It means that... In order to give, and especially when you're making representations to a court, under the, you under have a the duty. Perjury, you have yes. a duty as counsel. You have a duty as a litigant. You have a duty as a citizen. When you make representations to a court to ensure as best as possible, you're not going to get correct all the time. No. But to ensure as best as possible, you don't do it improperly. You don't do it imperfectly, and you do not give false account. And That's these the are some of the excerpts. I think we could bring it back. Yeah, I think we could bring it back now. We we had um. Right, so, so I think I think so. Those are the facts essentially on what on and what those. We the last thing we read, those are the excerpts from the transcript yeah. of the proceedings that Mr. Amor said that he merely was a note taker, a junior lawyer, mm -hmm. and a minimal researcher. Yeah, this is someone and who is conducting cross examination. And all due respect, as long as those transcripts are authentic, and I have no reason to doubt they are, and I don't think Mr. Moore has doubted any of the transcripts mm -hmm. or any of the documents that were produced, um, as long as those things are authentic, in my respectful view, he played much more of a significant role yeah. than a junior lawyer, much more of a significant role than a mere note taker, mm -hmm. and much more of a significant role than a minimal researcher or researching, yeah. doing minimal research. I agree. And therefore, the question arises, was he being forthright with the court? Mm -hmm. Was he being honest with the court? Um, when he swore an affidavit, not in his personal capacity, but on behalf of the people of Trinidad and... Well, those, are all, those are all questions. I am sure that Mr. Biharial, Queen's Council, will, will, um, we'll will touch seek to several touch. of the speakers. Will, will right, touch so, it. so let's, let's take a break and, let's, um, and let's, we'll be back in about two or three minutes with Mr. Biarrell, Queen's Council.
Sitaram, you are invited to join Radio and TV Jagati Mondays to Saturdays from 4 to 6 a.m. for inspirational and devotional programming. Our respected pundits of the SDMS will guide us through prayers and teachings to allow us the best start to our day. Morning Devotion, Mondays to Saturdays from 4 to 6 a.m. on Radio and TV Jagati. Hey my friends, you are invited to join us for a brand new program on radio and TV Jagati with Mrs. Sharada Maharaj every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on your number one. Inspirational, enlightening and uplifting. Ek Saath with Mrs. Sharada Maharaj on radio and TV Jagati Thursdays at 4 p.m. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. No need for introduction. You all know who we are. So let's get down to business. I tell you all thanks eh, for not informing on me when you see me shooting behind your brother in the middle of the road. Now. Or when you see me put the drugs in the hole right in the wall around the corner. Or when I break in your neighbor house and empty it out. And I know you didn't tell the police where they hide the gun that I know you see. But no need to complain because that is not your business. Eh? So when I come to rob you tomorrow with the same gun I know you see me hide. Do sell my out, eh? Thanks again. Join us this and every 11 a.m. for Let's Talk Sports on TV Jaggerty. A new and dynamic sports program where we look at the major headlines and feature our local sporting community. We discuss the issues of the day and give you a chance to learn more about the development of sports in our country. Let's Talk Sports, Sundays at 11 a.m. on TV Jagrity. I am Shervani Sakai, you to be a part of my sensation, Bollywood's best on TV. TV Jagriti. Tune in every Sunday morning from 10 to 11 as together we count down the top 10 biggest and best Bollywood videos of the week, check out the latest movie previews and of course what's trending with your favorite Bollywood celebrities. It's the only of its kind on national television so don't miss it. Bollywood's best every Sunday morning from 10 to 11 exclusive to TV Jagriti. Ram, you are invited to join His Holiness, the Dharmacharya of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Pandit Dr. Ram Pasad Paris Ram, every Wednesday from 12.30 to 1 p.m. on radio and TV Jagriti for the program Understanding Dharma, helping us lift ourselves from the mundane to the sublime, from turmoil to peace, from bondage to salvation. Understanding Dharma with our Dharmacharya, His Holiness Pandit Dr. Ram Pasad Paris Ram every Wednesday from 12.30 to 1 p.m. on radio and TV Jagrati. Sitaram. I don't know what to do, ma'am. He's my children's father and I really love him, but he only reacts like this when he drinks. Ma'am, I will ensure that you get all the help that you need. The Trinidad Antigo Police Service is devoted to providing assistance to victims of domestic violence. If you're a victim of domestic violence, a report should be made to the police immediately so the matter can be addressed in the most appropriate manner. Domestic violence is very serious. Do not wait until it's too late.
वेलकम वेलकम बैक टू सेक्शन वन वी आर अ लिटिल जोक बिफोर हैंड दैट दैट कोट मी अ बिट ऑफ गार्ड बट आम बट ऑफ कोर्स यू सी एन एडिशन टू दी आम टू दी सेट एंड इज नॉन अनन मिस्टर आनंद बी हरिलाल क्वींस काउंसल कैल एंड आई फर्स्टली मिस्टर बी हरिलाल वी आर प्रिविलेज टू हैव यू हियर आम इट इज आवर ऑनर टू हैव अस हैव यू हियर बिक� Very well. Sometimes we have Dinesh here. We have other people here. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's sometimes good to have someone of of Mr. Queen's Bihari Council. Lads, Queen's yeah, Council here. Let me let me don't get into well, to yes, Dinesh. That's very much. kind of you to say. Yes. Thank yes. Yes. Much. For those of you, and thank you um, for taking time off from yeah. from um, your. I assume it's your vacation. Yes. Sure yes. That, yeah. Well, well um, we apologize for bringing you out on your vacation. Not at all. No apologies. When duty right. when duty calls. So I yes. think um, people may be familiar with Mr. Bihari. He's um, called to the bar of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm-hmm. He is a Queen's Council called to the bar of England and Wales. Mm-hmm. He has practiced extensively in the Privy Council. Um, I think just recently, Jagrati had him on, and he gave an, a very, very um, erudite lecture on the role of the Privy Council and yeah. why the Privy Council is very important to Commonwealth countries like Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so we're very privileged to have him on, and mm-hmm. and and, and um, thank you for coming. Yeah. Not at all. I'm happy to be here. So well, I wish you had come here, perhaps under less controversial circumstances. <laughs> But you see what is happening in Trinidad, mm-hmm. and of course, we want to ask you some questions, generally. Yeah. Stephanie, I think I think before we get into the the crux of the matter, I mean, Kyle and I, we spent some time, almost almost forty minutes, getting into the facts. We will get to that just now, Mr. Um, Bihari. But in your views, what is a uh, let Let's start very very simplistic, and we move up. Um, what is the role of a attorney general in your eyes? Well, the role of the attorney general um, is multifaceted. It is not one particular thing. Um, first and foremost, the tradition is that he is the or she is the titular head of the bar. They are the senior most member of the legal profession. They are the ambassador, <coughs> the ultimate ambassador for attorneys at law in Trinidad and Tobago. So they hold, by custom and by practice, a very prominent role in the best of who the legal profession profess to be. Mm-hmm. As attorney general. That is an important constitutional uh, position, uh, as you may know. Some people may know. To form a government, you must have a prime minister, and you must have a cabinet. But generally speaking, under the constitution, if you have a prime minister and an attorney general, your government is then formed. So you have your mm-hmm. cabinet. And uh, for those who are interested, it's in the constitution. It's section seventy-five. Uh, uh, which is worth looking at. Many people uh, may wonder, well, where does that come from? Where is that to be found? Um, you were commenting earlier, uh, Kyle, as uh, to the various responsibilities that an attorney general has, and in the same uh, constitution, the attorney general's responsibilities—the word "responsible"—is expressly used, and uh, it is said that he is responsible for the administration. Of legal affairs in Trinidad and Tobago, so he has an important role, not just as a member of the government, as a member of the cabinet. He also has a huge responsibility for the administration of legal affairs in Trinidad and Tobago, and that is why the Constitution provides that in the case of civil proceedings, whether brought for or against the Attorney General or the State of Trinidad and Tobago, they are brought in the name. Of the Attorney General, and that's why we often see when proceedings are there, you see the Attorney General. That's right. Versus. Mm-hmm. That's right. So the Attorney General himself, although he may not be personally involved in mm-hmm. presenting the case, he has attorneys in the Solicitor General's office who may do so. The name of the Attorney General is important, and yes. the uh, person who holds that particular office uh, holds that uh, power of prominence. Uh, and position of prominence. The other thing is that the Attorney General is a member of the advisory committee of the power of pardon, and that's quite important because the Attorney General then has direct involvement in criminal cases at the very end of those criminal proceedings. And one of the things you were talking about is um, his involvement as an attorney in a case in, in a case in Miami, mm-hmm. uh, which in Trinidad and Tobago has. Um, various features, one of which is criminal. Criminal. Yeah. Uh, so that is something that uh, is potentially quite important. And so you can see that both under the uh, under the constitution and under the conventions we're talking about, the position of the attorney general is not merely a minister in a government. Uh, yeah. They carry a huge responsibility uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and one particular one which is um, uh, worth mentioning is that. Although we have 
a person known as the ombudsman who has the power to investigate uh, various wrongdoing that may occur in, uh, by public officials. The Attorney General can certify that certain matters cannot be investigated by the Ombudsman, uh, usually involving the government of Trinidad and Tobago and any other government or any other international organization. So the Attorney General is not simply an important person constitutionally. They also wield a considerable amount of power in the administration of legal affairs in Trinidad and Tobago and for the Republic of Trinidad uh, and Tobago. It's interesting you mention that because mm. many times, and I mean we see it, there are many times where citizens don't have a standard legal remedy yeah. Yeah. and they end up at the office of the Ombudsman. Yeah. That's right. And it, the, the Attorney General here is actually given a sort of, I suppose it's a <coughs> quasi-judicial power. He can discontinue an That's investigation right. by yeah. an Ombudsman yeah. mm. depriving a citizen of some type of remedy. Yeah. So he has a very, very important role. Yeah. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Um, and as a senior counsel, not you don't mm. have to be a senior counsel to be Attorney General. I think our previous mm. Attorney General in Trinidad and Tobago was not a senior counsel. Mm. I think that's, he was not, that's yeah. right. He, he was, was not. not. Yeah. So um, you don't have to be a senior counsel, but being a senior counsel also carries with it um, uh, a very important degree of uh, prominence in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, a senior counsel, SC or SILC as they are sometimes called, represent the select few of the most learned lawyers in the legal profession whose hallmarks are not limited to being an excellent advocate and I, I understand that Reginald Armour is an excellent advocate well deserving of his appointment mm -hmm. to Silk of course. Um, but also it's a hallmark of the highest integrity mm -hmm. uh, the highest honor that is why that is another quality of becoming and being appointed a senior counsel and assuming it follows the same scheme mm -hmm. that is followed in England, mm -hmm. which is where we inherit the silk system from, mm -hmm. um, you have to possess those qualities and you are assumed to possess those qualities and have demonstrated them over a long, long period of time. And just to be clear, in, in England it's called Queen's Council. Queen's Council. And of yeah. course when we adopted the, when we, I suppose, yeah. became independent and republic, yeah. we started referring to that esteemed position as sure. senior counsel. That's right. Well, yeah. uh, just, just to be precise on that, mm -hmm. when Trinidad and Tobago <coughs> became a, uh, an independent state, mm -hmm. Uh, the Queen was still head of state, yeah, so mm -hmm. Queen's Council remained. Mm -hmm. And you may recall that Carl Hudson Phillips had uh, kept his Queen's yes, Council yes. title uh, yes. for many, many years, right yeah. up until uh, he, uh, he passed. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing. I mean, <laughs> Senior Council, Queen's Council, uh, it's, it, it's of no real difference yes. uh, because you are still a senior, the senior member of the legal profession. And mm -hmm. as I say, not just an excellent advocate, but a person of the highest integrity and honor. And that's important because once you are important as senior counsel, you're not merely expected to be a good advocate. Yeah. Uh, you exemplify the very best of who we are as attorneys at law. Mm -hmm. um, you mean what you say. And when you say it, you will, that you're going to do a thing, you do what you claim. Yeah. Yeah. And that is assumed. Yeah. In other words, your word is golden. Yes. That's yeah. the way, way it, it's phrased. You're, you're a leader at the bar. No? Absolutely. Yeah. And oftentimes, Stefan, you would know, and of course you would know, um, Alan, <laughs> mm -hmm. when we litigate with other lawyers, sometimes you have an understanding with a lawyer. Yeah. You, mean it's, you may mm. not put something down in paper or writing. Yeah. Then I would call, for instance, an extension of time is yeah. a good yeah. example. That's right. I would call a colleague and I would say, you know, I need an extension. He would say, go ahead. Yeah. I don't expect him tomorrow to pretend he didn't have that conversation mm. yeah. with me. Correct. It's correct. an honor code mm. amongst attorneys and yeah. I suppose mm. the word of senior counsel is perhaps even, even greater. Yeah, it's yeah. even yeah. greater. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, as you know, I mean, you've been talking about it uh, a little earlier. Mm -hmm. The primary duty of an attorney at law, though most people think that um, an attorney at law has a primary duty to their client, they have to do what their clients say and mm -hmm. so on. There are a lot of myths uh, that surround that. But in fact, the primary duty of an attorney at law is to uh, conduct themselves uh, within the boundary of the law mm -hmm. and when they are in court not to mislead the court yeah. because the court assumes that when counsel is speaking or making a statement or making an affidavit what they are saying is mm -hmm. true and they will not question uh, whether it is true or not they assume it is because yeah. you are an attorney and you wouldn't say uh, otherwise mm -hmm. so the duty to a client is in that context secondary to the duty to the court yes. the first duty is always to the court you do not waste time you do not say things which you 
uh, which are not true, you do not say things which you haven't checked, and so on and so yes. forth. Because you are taken at your word, and, and rightly so, because if you could not take an attorney <coughs> at their word, then the entire process of conducting litigation in any court would grind to a halt because every time somebody said something, you'd have to check it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so ha being an attorney at law gives you that extra um, standing yes. that mm -hmm. what you say, we can accept. Yeah, and the court expects that you are telling them you're being forthright mm -hmm. and they can depend on what you say. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's no different the attorney general because the attorney general is uh, not simply as I say, a minister and a, a member of the government. But they also hold an important role in upholding the rule of law more generally. And to be fair, the attorney, the Office of the Attorney General of Legal Affairs um, does have on its website, anybody can check it, that commitment, the commitment to the holistic development in Trinidad and Tobago uh, uh, through the promotion of the rule of law at all levels of society. And um, it is intended to do a number of things, one of which it makes a resolution to create public value through the development of specialist legal services in the areas that are of importance to the state and simultaneously, and this is perhaps the important part, provide to us, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, the stakeholders, mm -hmm. if you like, a safe and enabling environment delivered with respect, equity, integrity, so as to stimulate increased productivity and greater confidence in the rule of Law. And those are very and those are very very powerful words. Absolutely, uh, very powerful words. <laughs> I suppose each society would have something similar. Similar, yeah. Correct. We have affirmed and declared, or the Office of the Attorney General, mm -hmm. absolutely, has affirmed and declared. And of course, that would apply to any mm -hmm. Attorney General yeah. coming into there. Yeah. They have these sacred duties, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and and rightly so, yeah. because this is why an Attorney General is such an important person not yeah. just in the government but also in the law and also for the bar yeah. as and why he is rightly head of the bar yeah, yeah. Uh, but it also w whenever things go wrong <clears throat> yes and this is something which uh, i know is is central to the discussion we are having uh, at the moment when things go wrong and questions start to be asked controversy arises it undermines that confidence Mm -hmm. It uh, creates a situation where people are saying, well, hang on, why has that happened? I speak for myself. If I am required to make a statement or swear an affidavit, which, remember, is on oath. I'm yeah. taking an oath saying that this document mm -hmm. is true. I would not do so. One, if it was not true, I would say I can't swear to something which is not true. Oh. I have to uh, make sure that it is accurate. Mm -hmm. But it's those words, make sure it is accurate. I would make sure and check yeah. before I committed to anything in writing, before I made any commitment on oath, that what I am going to say mm -hmm. is accurate. And I think that's a hallmark yeah. of any attorney. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it definitely it's a, it's an obligation of a litigant or anyone bringing litigation. Yeah. And, and attorneys have a duty to explain that yeah. to litigants, that to means, your clients. And that means the duty on an attorney is even higher. And, yeah. and therefore, I suppose you could even go another tier. It's even higher when you come to the state because yeah. the state has a special responsibility to the court. Mm. You see it in judicial review proceedings all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting you mention that because mm. an attorney general exemplifies the highest public authority mm -hmm. in yeah. the legal uh, world, so yeah. to yes. speak. Not just the legal <coughs> profession, yeah. but in terms of public bodies. Yeah. I mean, you can have yeah. the courts, you have the office of DPP, you have various uh, quasi-judicial bodies who may exercise certain functions. But the duty that you're talking about is a duty of uh, candor. It's a duty to be straight, that if you are dealing with something and you have information mm -hmm. that may be relevant to the determination of the case that the claimant may not have. Even if it's against your interest. Yeah. Even if it is against your interest, mm -hmm. there's a positive obligation to be fair and say, look, I've got this material. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't rely on it, but I disclose it to you because you may wish to rely on it. And, yeah. and that's part and parcel, isn't it, of the honor of mm -hmm. the attorney yes. at law. Yes. Uh, and you don't have to be a senior counsel. All attorneys at law commit to that if yep. you are representing the state or, or, or have any role in representing a public authority. You are expected to conduct yourself in that in way. In that manner, yes. Yeah. And one of the things you touched on there, and it's something I've been thinking about myself, not only since this issue has arisen, but, you know, throughout my legal career, because you always hear the term, confidence in the rule of law, yeah. confidence in public office. But, but why, why, why do we say confidence? Why is it important, in your view, 
for the population to have confidence in things. Um, my reasoning is that it's <coughs> something like we say, well, you can't hold a big stick over everybody at all points in time. Sure. And therefore, for people to comply with norms, values, rules, culture, etc., that we expect, behavior that we expect, it, there must be something more than a big stick. Yeah. You must have confidence in something and you must appreciate something. And I suppose for the attorney general to command the respect that he has, you have to have some kind of confidence in that. I don't know if that sort of... Well, the attorney general, when, the attorney gen when proceedings are brought in the attorney general's name, as we've been talking mm -hmm. about, the person who is speaking on behalf of the attorney general is going to be representing the most truthful, the most accurate position. Yeah. Okay. The attorney general himself, whether it's in parliament or out of parliament, by virtue of the office he holds, mm -hmm. is expected to discharge a very similar function. Mm -hmm. um, you may have heard that even attorneys at law, when uh, 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 I think our disciplinary committee mm -hmm. and our court of appeal have said <coughs> in um, uh, uh, some cases, which have established the principle. It doesn't matter whether you take off your robe and your bands and you decide to you know, go off and have a drink with your friends. You are, you are expected to conduct yourself yep. with a level of integrity, with a level of honor that is consistent with being an attorney at law, whether you are in court or out of court. Mm. And if that is a responsibility of the attorney at law, then it must apply even more uh, powerfully, even more uh, substantially, mm -hmm. to a person who is the head yes. yeah. of the legal profession, yeah. the senior most yes. attorney at law. Well, first of all, as mm -hmm. a senior counsel, and then secondly, mm. and as compoundingly, the I suppose, yeah. Yeah. as the attorney general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's so many levels. It's the attorney at law, senior counsel, and then the top attorney, yeah. the attorney yeah. general. Yeah. So you, you would expect that um, anybody who holds these important positions uh, in Trinidad and Tobago and in any Commonwealth democracy mm -hmm. will do so uh, uh, upholding the best traditions of integrity and honor. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we're getting a short... Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think we, what we did is we we'll had a short break. Uh, All right. We understand Mr. Biharilal does and he explains it so that... That I was an to, excellent yeah, idea. We need to, to soak that up. So yeah, let's soak it up, let's digest All it right. and we'll come back and yeah. we'll start back again. Sure. Your child's safety is top priority. Hi, Miss Silly. Thanks, Amelia. I'll be back by 10. Bye, T. Be very cautious when choosing a caregiver. Don't let this be your horror story. A message from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service.
right so welcome back guys i hope that everybody's following um we're trying to make simplify things as much as possible we consider the facts we spoke about the role of the attorney general role of a senior counsel the importance mm -hmm. of trust and confidence in the legal profession and those who lead the legal profession the inner bar that being the group of senior counsel that leads the wider bar of lawyers and also the head of the bar or the titular head of the body, Attorney General, his constitutional role in the state and his role on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, to put it simply. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we also wanted to touch on, because these proceedings, as we said earlier, they dealt with Mr. Amor, not only in his role as an Attorney General, but as an attorney representing um, persons who were charged um, criminally or faced the criminal courts in Trinidad and Tobago. And you see, what happened essentially is that he represented them in one proceeding and then he gave evidence against them in another proceedings. Now, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean automatically that you can't, but it, I think it's important that you have to be forthright with a court when you're explaining things. And I think that was a, but to understand the issue, we need to understand, Anand, what is this thing about conflict of interest? I think people understand, well, you know, there's a conflict. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do things that you're in conflict. What is this thing? conflict of interest why is it special in the legal profession what is this concept of privilege that when you tell your attorney something um, you can trust that that is privilege and that you could have confidence that that won't see the light of day without your permission okay yeah. um well <clears throat> e e essentially conflict of interest is exactly what it what it says on the tin yeah if you have an obligation to one person one client and there is, you, you take on another obligation, another instruction from another client, and there is a conflict between them. You cannot perform your function as an attorney at law. Yeah. The example that can be given, you know, Trinidad and Tobago likes, la likes land cases, yeah. all right? Yes, so uh, that is true. so we'll, we'll use that as an example. If you are representing a person who is a landlord in a dispute over the tenancy of land, you couldn't then take on the same case to make representations for someone who may have an interest mm -hmm. as a tenant or as a subtenant or connected to the tenant yeah. in relation to that land. Mm -hmm. um, and that's important to understand because if you are instructed as an attorney at law and your client finds out that you are speaking to the opposing party without his permission, in a way that undermines his interest, mm -hmm. your client would have good reason to be unhappy. Yes. Yeah. And the disciplinary committee of the Law Association exists to resolve complaints like that. Mm -hmm. So when a complaint is made, a complaint which is made that a person was conflicted mm -hmm. and should not have been acting uh, for two people where their interests were different, mm -hmm. uh, could land you into a lot of trouble as an attorney at law. So. When we're talking about a conflict of interest, we're talking about making sure that the person you represent, you are able to perform your function without fear or favor and completely, mm -hmm. without any interference by somebody else's interest. Yes. Okay? Uh, uh, and not simply just somebody else, but another potential client. Because remember, to each client you represent, mm -hmm. you have the same obligation to do your best for them, to keep their secrets, confidentiality and you mentioned that and, and confidentiality is quite important because when you speak to an attorney at law it is like going to speak to uh, your pundit in private it is like going to speak to the priest in, uh, mm -hmm. in confession and, and things like that you are going to speak to your attorney at law and you want to have a candid conversation the client may come to you and say look these are the difficulties I face they, they may be very difficult to talk about those difficulties mm -hmm. these are the problems I have and I would like some legal advice yeah. as to how I can resolve that difficulty you must be able to give the advice without any kind of restriction that you may may be acting against the, the interests of another client yes and if there is any potential for that to happen the rule generally is, well, you should not allow yourself to be conflicted yes. because you have that positive obligation of confidentiality. Yeah. Um, and talking about confidentiality, how can you keep the confidence of your client mm -hmm. if you're acting for somebody who has a conflicting interest? Yeah. It, it, it becomes <clears throat> impossible. And we are not without a remedy. I mean, this is, again, something which... Um, is important for, for, for the public to understand. Attorneys at law... Uh, spend 
so many years studying law and so many years qualifying as an attorney uh, because they are drumming into them not just the knowledge of the law but also how you conduct yourself as a lawyer and your obligations to clients. That's why they separate the study of your law degree, which is the academic, learning the law as a subject, to qualifying as an attorney at law, where you learn things like how to be an advocate, how to present an argument, but also ethics. And that is uh, a critical uh, uh, part of the job. Because yeah. we have a code of conduct. We have a code of conduct. And you have ethical obligations That's to your right. client, yeah. to the Within court, code, to yeah. other attorneys, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. at large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you, uh, and in, in relation to clients, mm -hmm. um, one of the things you have a positive obligation to do, which is provided for in the code of conduct, is to always act in the best interests of your client, to represent them honestly, competently, and zealously and endeavor by all fair and honorable means to obtain for them the benefit of any and every remedy and defense which is authorized by law, steadfastly bearing in mind that the duties and responsibilities of an attorney at law are to be carried out within and not without, in other words, not outside yes, the bounds yeah. of, of the, the law. law. Yeah. So that couldn't be clearer. Yeah. I mean, every attorney who's qualified in Trinidad and Tobago is familiar with that rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we know that if we are going to take on a case to represent a client, whether it's the government, whether it's an individual, whether it's an individual against the government or a company or whoever it may be, we have to be able to fulfill our legal obligations completely, uh, and without think, exception. And I think it's, it's, yeah. it's that, that frankness that you have mm. with your attorney at law to be able to confide in him, it yeah. takes on a, a sort of special role in criminal proceedings. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Because... Well, I mean, I mean, remember reading some of it. It says essentially, you have to be able to advise your, your tender proper legal advice. Yeah. Yeah. You can't give proper legal advice on a criminal matter if you don't have all of the facts mm -hmm. to advise him in confidence. And that's why I stated from the beginning that that look, especially in criminal proceedings, proceedings yeah. the 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 instructions part of things when you now meet the client and you take all of these instructions so critical yeah. because I, I, how are you to now yeah. to defend your client against yeah. criminal charges if you Absolutely. don't know yeah. the entirety of the thing and that is where we mm. we get into this entire situation now with the, on, the uh, honorable attorney general mm. um i think but Kyle, if we if we want to move forward with it because mm. I, I see we get a couple um mm. signs on the back there i think right okay good we get another sign from you back to hold yeah yeah i thought it was different i thought it was to hold right yeah. <coughs> right good so 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 confidence privilege yeah. and, and that also plays an important part of the rule of law yeah. correct absolutely well when we talk about confidence in the rule of law yeah. we are talking about all of these multifaceted yes. things mm -hmm. the attorney who can be taken at his word mm -hmm. the fact that when an attorney says something one can accept okay a statement has been made, an affidavit has been sworn, it is correct, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So if, if for example, if in, a, in a, an exceptional case, and unfortunately there have been cases in the past mm -hmm. where attorneys at law may have abused their privileges yes, as yeah. an attorney at law, may have, have misrepresented something, mm -hmm. either deliberately or carelessly. Well, if that were to have happened, if, if you've taken money from a client, yeah. and not done the work. Mm. These are things which are considered the opposite of integrity, mm -hmm. the opposite of being honest, the opposite of, of honor mm -hmm. uh, in, in the legal profession. And so um, I, can't, I can't speak more clearly about the fact that any attorney at law has to conduct themselves very carefully yeah. Yeah. in relation oh. to matters. And you, you mentioned criminal cases. Strictly speaking, the obligation in criminal and civil cases is the same. Yes. It doesn't matter whether you are mm. uh, representing a criminal defendant or prosecuting yes. a criminal defendant. It doesn't matter whether you are a claimant in a case or a defendant in a case. The obligations are pretty much the same, yeah. whichever enough. side you are. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, and, and I suppose moving, why we don't want to directly comment on it. Yeah. In relation to what we have here, here you had a lawyer becoming attorney general and then bringing proceedings or be having proceedings brought in his name against a former client. And while one may say, well, it's because of the post he holds, you would agree with me. And I, I, I cross examine it, but I think I think you can try. You can try. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't try. But but it had to be that if you are put in that position as an attorney at law, you had to be very careful about what you do. 
Yeah. If you had to give evidence to a court on that issue as an attorney at law, you, fought right. you had to be fought right. Mm -hmm. And there was an enormous responsibility to get it right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's important to, to remember, uh, mm. Gil, that um, we're all attorneys at law. Yes. Okay. We have to remember there are always two sides mm -hmm. to every story. I mean, yes, well, it's, one of the, it's one of the obligations that uh, we as attorneys at law have, mm -hmm. that we should always be cautious about making a particular, giving a particular advice, for example, to a client. Yeah. You can't say to your client, you're definitely going no, to win 100%. this case. Yeah. 100%. Sure it's yeah. a sure winner. <laughs> yeah. Even if that may be true, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be careful. you have to be cautious yes. in how you give the advice because... Mm -hmm. It could, you haven't heard all of the evidence. You haven't heard what the other side are going right. to say. And the other side, you may read all of the documents you've got and say, this is a cast iron win. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you get the other side's doc evidence and documents and you think, hang on. Yeah. That changes the picture and, completely. And that's why sometimes lawyers, when they get the evidence, they have to give advice Absolutely. on evidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is why we are prohibited mm -hmm. by the Code of Conduct from proffering, well, we're not prohibited, but we are warned mm -hmm. Um, from proffering bold and confident assurances to a client, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, always bearing in mind that there are two sides to every story. I mean, that's in our yeah. code of conduct. So to be fair to the Attorney General on, on, on this particular issue, we're not going to be able to comment on the specifics mm -hmm. because one of the things um, I uh, would welcome is to hear uh, from any p party uh, who um, is... Uh, uh, who, where these types of questions are in the public interest are being raised, well, what do they have to say about it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what are they going to say about it? Do they have an answer that would reassure me completely that there's yeah. really nothing in this? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 but, you know, I mean, it, it kind of underscores everything we're talking about. It, it means that if I'm going to, I'm going to use myself as, a, as an example. If I am required by a court to confirm a particular state of affairs mm -hmm. or, or what that state of affairs may be. Yes. And let's say, as an example, that that state of affairs took place, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. I would probably say I need to check what the position is before I'm going to say anything in a witness statement or in an affidavit. Yeah. Because I myself might think, well, look, I remember now, uh -huh. but I, I, I would like to go back and look at... There's a doubt. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe I, I go back and I, I look at what the evidence was and mm -hmm. what my, my mm -hmm. particular role was. And actually, it happens a lot. You mm -hmm. mentioned criminal cases. <coughs> when um, attorneys change, so let's say a client was represented at trial and they have a new counsel in the Court of Appeal, yeah. the question may be asked, of the previous attorney at law, well, what did you do? Why did you do that? There was this particular piece of evidence. Did you ask a question about it? Did you consider it? Did you see it? Did you adopt this a defense? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, re remember, these are obligations we have as attorneys at law, and it can happen in a civil case as well. Mm -hmm. So what you would do before you say anything is, look, especially the, the, if it, this event had happened 10, 15 years before, yeah. I would say, well, hang on, that happened a little while ago. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm not going to respond straight away. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not going to respond while I'm on vacation, as I am now. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but what I would do is I would, I would say, look, hang on a minute. Let me go and check mm -hmm. before I say anything. And if I can't recall, I would say, well, I can't assist because I can't recall. It's been so long yeah. ago. And, you know, that's a very easy thing to say because yes. uh, we're all human. Yeah. And if things have happened uh, in the distant past... We're not going to remember every single thing that no. happened. No. And the number of cases we may be involved in over a period of 15 years as full-time attorneys at law, yeah. you're not going to be expected to remember everything in detail. But before you're, you put anything to writing, you would check. And, and I think certainly that's before you swear. Well, well, that's, the, that, that's a sort of another layer, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, if you're right. anybody saying, well, look, you've got to take an oath yeah. that a certain thing is true, you, you would I would say, well, hang on, can I actually do that yeah. before checking exactly. you know, yeah. Yeah. what to say? So that's quite important. I think, yeah, I think um, we have our first, first caller. Yeah. So we'll pause so, our, our, discussion. So our discussion. Mr. Bairro is with us. And so for <laughs> the callers that are calling in, you know, you're going to be. We want to get over. But local attorneys in, in right. Mr. Bihar is not also, he's also called to the Bafshan <laughs> attorney. So. But um, let's get, who do we have first? I believe we have Ms. Barrett. Ms. Barrett. 
Yes, perfect. Candice, um, are you there? Hi guys, good evening. How are Candace, you? How are you? Good evening. I am good. I hope um, we're not. I hope we're not disturbing dinner plans. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I'm still well, doing what we as Indians do. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, so you know, we've been having a discussion. I don't know how much of it you've been following, but mm -hmm. we have this. I've, I've actually seen from the beginning, and I oh. do find. Um, first off, I want to commend you and your team this evening in taking up this critical issue and the approach you've taken to this important issue because the analysis and the clarification of the facts and Queen's Council's perspective, I think, is genuinely invaluable in understanding what this issue is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So, mm -hmm. I mean, w well, you know, Candice, whether you want to delve directly, and if be bold enough and delve directly into the issues or you want to speak, peripherally about it and you i know you may be saving some fire for the meeting um <laughs> but um but but tell us tell us you know what 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 do you what is at the core of this issue for you and why do you think it's important that attorneys give their view on it one way or the other i think that is a very important question for all of us mm -hmm. as members of the legal profession and even members of the public to ask ourselves and as you know, but for the benefit of the viewers or listeners, I was one of the 40 attorneys who signed the petition for the requisition of the law association to call this special general meeting yes. to treat with this issue. And I, I did so because I felt that the fact supporting the issue is cause for grave concern with respect to public confidence, public perception, and accountability. And the matter, the way the matter was dealt with leaves much to be desired, right? When the reports were surfaced, I personally waited to see what our Honorable AG's response would have been because, you know, allow for the benefits of the doubt and any Natural sort of justice. mistake on the part of the media or whatnot. And lo and behold, his initial response was that henceforth he would be remaining silent on the issue. And I would say I was genuinely surprised because I thought that surely in the face of these allegations and the damning effect of it, not just locally but internationally, he would have been clean to clear the air. And I think this is what Queen's Council would have just touched on a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, that response of silence said a lot. Um, it could have been that he was being cautious, but hey, you have reports in a Miami court saying that there is a disqualification from acting due to misrepresentation on affidavit. And I think, first off, silence was really a bad way to start, right? Yeah. And it was only after a great amount of public outcry and the petition from the 40 attorneys to the law association, it seems, that the Honorable E.G. broke his silence on the issue. And... I think that that raises the question as well as to whether or not, if there had been a refusal to accept silence, including from eminent members of the legal profession, including the president, um, a former president of the Law Association, Senior Counsel Martin Daly, would any response have been forthcoming? And I'll pause here to highlight that this is why discussions like this and the refusal to accept the unacceptable is critical in holding our public office holders accountable. Yeah. And to me, regardless of which side of the fence you fall on, at the end of the day, you have to hold people accountable. And then he broke his silence and gave his response, which he forgot the extent of his involvement, which honestly I find a little bit surprising. I'm not I'm not yeah. in a position to say whether that really was the case. But in practice, we know that the rule that he described was that of a student, an intern. It yeah. cannot be the involvement of someone called to the bar for some years, yes. far less for someone who at that point had been senior counsel. Yes. Yeah. And to me, one of the problems we have, unfortunately, and it was kind of the elephant in the room, but I will say it, is that we can't separate politics and personalities from issues. And we can't deny the fact that the issue is tainted to some extent by politics. Yes. But one thing I would say is that I will appeal to all my colleagues and, you know, at the bar 
to soberly consider the facts in the public domain, which are uncontroverted. You know, you guys would have shown yeah. the orders of the court, the yeah. affidavits, what was said in the court proceedings. And, you know, we have to consider that free from any sort of emotion or attachment or even uh, dislike of anybody. And as a profession, decide what we are willing to accept. And that, to me, is why I, I signed the petition and why I will be attending on Friday, because I think that we have to set the standard and we have to raise the bar. And if it is that we feel that something is unacceptable, then we genuinely have to make a stand. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Candice, for your contribution. I, I wholly agree with you. I think the panel agrees uh, a yeah, lot with a lot with what you said. Um, succinctly summarize it. You said it much better than I could. So thanks so much for joining us. We have to move on, of course, to some other attorneys. So thank you very much for taking time off mm -hmm. to being here with us. Of course, no problem. And have a good evening to you guys. Take care. Thank you, Candice. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I think she's put it very um, very forthrightly. Yeah. She will be attending. She will be attending, yeah. <laughs> she um, made it very clear. And she, and, she, and, she, and, she, um, and, she, yeah, and she made a call to all of our colleagues at the bar, mm. um, whether you agree with the situation or not, to come out and express your views. I was just wondering, um, Alan, is there, is this something that also happens at the bar of England? Or, or is, there, is there a similar... Um, is there a similar type of... Um, I mean, we saw a big... Yeah, I was motion not going to no yeah, yeah. yeah. bring up... I said, yeah, yeah. I said in, yeah. you, had the biggest, you had the biggest yeah, yeah. Motion, yeah. Motion, yeah. Of, motion of she no confidence. She even took over headlines here in Trinidad. But is it, is it something that happens in the Bar of England? Where, well, where? generally speaking, mm. an Attorney General is an uncontroversial figure. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, hmm. generally speaking, because um, it, it's relatively rare, rare for an Attorney General to be involved directly mm. in controversy yeah. because yeah. the nature of the office holder is always someone of tremendously high integrity it's very unusual yeah, right? yeah. Um, uh, and you have to remember we follow the Westminster system we, yeah. we choose to follow it mm. that's how our governments are yeah. elected how yeah. our prime ministers are appointed <coughs> our judges are appointed and, and, and so mm. on and so forth so um, we follow a certain model but when it comes to the Attorney General I think that the, there's a reason why traditionally, although the Attorney General may become a parliamentarian, mm -hmm. they are not usually elected. Mm. That is something that is actually relatively recent yeah. as something that is happening in the Commonwealth um, mm -hmm. as, as a whole. I mean, certainly in England, um, <coughs> the preference has always been to appoint the Attorney General to the Upper House. I yes. see. And you may draw them from the bar, yes. a senior counsel, yeah. uh, and you would say this person has proven their worth as an advocate, proven their worth as, as learned in the law, a person of great integrity, and so on and so forth. So you appoint them to the position of attorney I general. Suppose, I suppose to some extent it insulates them and from the regular... Well, yeah, that was exactly well, what I was going to say. Exactly. And that, uh, that is a, a legitimate consideration yeah. because remember the attorney general has to <coughs> advise in the same way we do as an attorney at law, objectively. Yeah. Yeah. The government, with all of the <coughs> politics, and we know what politics is exactly. like, may not like the advice from the attorney, yeah. but the attorney has an obligation to give it unvarnished. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So when you appoint someone as attorney general, the expectation that attorney general is going to advise the government in exactly the same way. Yeah. Perhaps even with an enhanced standard of mm -hmm. caution yeah. to say, look, um, this a course of action is ill-advised because it may breach the false. Mm -hmm. Or if you wish to take a particular course of action, you should change the law. Yeah. That is the kind of advice that an attorney general might give that we wouldn't be able to give about yeah. changing the law yeah. uh, and yeah. so forth. I mean, I know that our uh, incumbent attorney general has um, uh, very, very passionately about adopting the Caribbean Court of Justice, for example. Yeah. But to do that... To, to, to deal with such an important Potential. issue, yeah. you have to be able to uh, case of the pros yeah. and the cons, cons and to advise the government and accordingly. Give, give objective advice. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And so I think his appointment to the Senate mm -hmm. is a good thing mm -hmm. because there's yeah. a degree of insulation. <coughs> yeah. He should not be affected by the politics in the same way that an elected official with yeah. constituents and so on yeah. uh, might yeah. be. So that is why position in the upper house is sensible. And um, if 
controversy arises, you can always remove them without too much difficulty. Exactly. That's, and, a uh, well, that's, that's a convention. Well, that's the convention. And that is the convention. Uh, but you can't I, easily remove some elected official. Well, you can't. You yeah. can't. You can't <laughs> remove you can't, an elected yeah. official. Yeah. But um, that creates a, a process whereby mm -hmm. there is a, an inherent accountability. That yes. If, for example, the prime minister may be dissatisfied with the performance of the attorney general. And we've seen this happen in the past. Mm -hmm. In Trinidad and Tobago, the Prime Minister can say, look, I, I, I don't feel you can continue. Thank yeah. you And I would much. like a resignation. Yeah. yeah. Do we have... So, we, do have, we, another, have... we have another thing at <coughs> law. Oh, Mr. Sean Mahis. The Mr. Ever, Mahis? The young Mr. Mahis, always outspoken. Sean, are you there? Yes, I am. I must say a fierce picture. A I fierce picture, say. Sean. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> Professional um, picture. So, yes. Sean, and, and, you know, I know that you, you are the head of... Um, an association, the Eastern Law. I believe that's the name of the association. Well, I'm not even, but I'm one of the, the, one of, one of the heads yes. in the organization. So, so, so tell us, Sean, I mean, here in the discussion, um, what are your views on this issue and why do you think it's important to the legal profession and, and to the rule of law and to our the future of our profession as a young lawyer? Yes. Well, uh, firstly, I'd like to just say, unlike the last call, I am not one of those who signed the petition. Right. But I am very grateful that there was one mm -hmm. because it gives us the opportunity to have this discussion and have a vote at the law association on Friday. Um, I'm also pleased that there'll be wider involvement because it'll be a hybrid meeting where not only you'll be there in person to, to vote and express your views, but you may have that opportunity um, online. So that, that benefits lawyers from the rural parts of the country, um, uh, you know, as far as south as Point Fortin or Separia or Sangre Grande, where I'm from. And um, it means that you don't have to come all the way to Port of Spain to be involved. And that in itself is an equalizing measure that the Law Association has instituted for this meeting. And I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, the legal profession, however, it, we need to know that contrary to what may be represented out there, the legal profession is a very diverse group of people. And we have a very diverse makeup, not just in ethnic and religious and political views, but lawyers are a bunch of independent thinkers. And they can never agree on anything and always have a different vantage point which they can bring to any discussion. So it's important for the persons in the legal profession to have opportunities not just to vote, but also to have the discussion, um, to make their views known, to flesh out their views in the public domain, like what you all are offering here tonight, to go on the floor of the Law Association and be able to make representation. And so, when we think about what the benefit is to the legal profession, we have not had an opportunity like this in the law association to discuss a serious issue that affects what we think about ourselves for some time. What are our standards? What are our ethical standards? But not only that, what are our moral virtues and values that we would like to uphold in the society? And I think it's very important that not just senior lawyers or people in the political arena, but the lay young lawyer who is men into the profession and wants to help define what he wants to be part of as a profession. And I think it's very important that the, we have a say, and I'm very glad we have that opportunity on site. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Um, eloquent as usual. Eloquent as usual, and, and of course, um, I know you, you, would you be attending or you'd be logging on? Well, just out of uh, deference to the location where I'll be coming from, I'm going to stay outside of uh, the locality and see how it is virtually and, yeah. and test that uh, Test it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure, your, you, I'm sure your, presence, your presence will be felt. <laughs> you, are, you, you have Mr. Bihari, no, no, I'm well, laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Sean mentioned something I think yes. that's very important mm -hmm. about young attorneys coming into the profession. Yeah, I know yeah. you are someone who teaches 
and lectures on ethics, ethics yeah. Yeah. Um, in the profession. And I suppose that's that's important to instill in young in younger lawyers as mm -hmm. they carry themselves through the profession. It, it, it is important. I mean, it's perhaps the most important aspect of the subject matter we're talking about because yeah. when it comes to ethics, it starts at the very beginning of your career. Mm. That's true. <coughs> But it also, we also look to the senior most people yes. who set the standard. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are they doing? How should we do it? Exactly. Not just the senior lawyers, but the senior counsel. Not just yeah. the senior counsel, but the senior most counsel, the attorney general. Yeah. And um, I think that that is why uh, any controversy <coughs> surrounding the person who occupies that office is unsatisfactory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we want the person who holds that office, and I, I have to say, I'm a, uh, I was very pleased when uh, Reginald Armour was appointed. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a senior counsel of oh, so many, many years standing, mm -hmm. uh, a, a good advocate in his own right, uh, uh, reaching the standards of excellence, and he and he had a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. He had a lot of experience. So I felt that when he was appointed, this was going to be a breath of fresh air. Yes. We're going to get a different perspective, yeah. no controversy, no yeah. baggage, and, and we're going to you know, s look at the, some of the more progressive things yeah. that the government that's in office can do, and, and, and in particular with law reform. Mm -hmm. And it didn't seem to, to last very long, and then suddenly this controversy arose, and I, I was very concerned because I had hoped that we would have um, quick resolution. Yeah. Everything discussed, it was obviously a misunderstanding yeah. and, mm. and, and, and so on and so forth. But I, I fear, and I've seen what Martin Daly has said and, 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 and Mr. George has said, um, it's, it seems to beg more questions and answers. than we have answers at the moment. And, yeah. and from the ethical perspective, we don't want young attorneys thinking, this is all right. This is okay. Exactly. We, we, well, well that, it's not all right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, whichever you know, explanation is eventually correct, it's not all right for an attorney to be surrounded by controversy mm -hmm. like this, exactly. where yeah. what you are saying to a court mm -hmm. is potentially questionable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and you know, you know that, that, that sort of triggers something in me that you said earlier about the rules of senior counsel. He is a senior counsel, and one of the most important roles, or they're described as a leader at the bar. Yeah. They're a leader at the bar. And yeah. I mean, I coming out, I, I did a lot of magistrate work. Mm -hmm. You did a lot of magistrate criminal work. Sometimes someone yeah. approaches and says, look, I need some advice. Could you come and do a trial for me? And yeah. you have 20, 50, sometimes 20, 30 minutes to prepare. So mm -hmm. Many times yeah. when you're a young attorney, you call a senior attorney. Yeah, you pick yeah. up the phone. It's yeah. something in our profession. Yeah. You say, mm -hmm. you know, hey, um, Dinesh or uh, um, you know, Anna mm -hmm. or whoever. Mm -hmm. You say, look, um, I have to do this. Do you think this is okay? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm acting for a purchaser, but he's saying, you know, he going to bring the vendors well in my office, yeah. and we'll both do agreement. You know, is, is that something mm -hmm. I can do? Yeah. It's so important that you are able to speak to a senior attorney mm -hmm. to find out. You know, rule of thumb, is yeah. this okay? Yeah. Can I progress? If I am to, what sort of precautions can I take? Exactly, yeah. And I suppose that's why, as a senior attorney now, he perhaps needs to set the right example yeah. and do the right thing. Yeah. Um, do we, we have, have another call? <clears throat> yeah. Who do Come we on, have on? Who do we have on? Oh, oh Mr. Mr. Lester Mr. Charia. Charia. Mr. Mr. Charia, how are you? Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, Mr. Lester. Good afternoon. So, so um, Lester, you know, I, I don't know if you've been following the discussion. Um, we, we've been speaking about the role of the attorney general, head of the, tit the titular head of the bar, role of senior counsel, leader of the bar, and some of the conduct or some of the actions that we've seen describe the public domain. Um, and then, of course, we have the action coming up on Friday. What are your thoughts about all of this? Why is it important for us to come and say what their views are and why is this important for our profession? <coughs> Well, let me start off by saying thank you for giving me this opportunity to join your program. I want to welcome your listeners both on TV and Radio Geography and to my fellow guests of the show, most notably, um, Brad Bihari, our senior counsel. Um, I think the work that you all are doing this evening is very important, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to play a part in this important discussion. Before we get into the integrity of the substantive part of the motion, uh, I just want to digress because I think I have to, on, on, on one or two key issues, you all have comprehensively rehearsed the important facts of the matter, but there are a couple of things that I think 
uh, merits mentioning. The first is the question of the publicity of the names of attorneys who signed the petition in this matter. Yeah. I'm not certain um, if, if, if everyone is aware. But there was um, a publication in a, in a national newspaper of the names of all the attorneys. Now, this is the first time in my recollection that something like this has actually happened. Mm. Um, I have not been practicing for very long, only since the early age. But during that time, I've seen other motions, and I've participated in other motions of similar nature. I've never seen anything like that before, where they would have given a comprehensive list of a tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say no more on that fact. Right. But I, am, I must say this. I am proud of those who, like me, signed this requisition. Yeah. Because it was clear, given the preamble to the requisition, and the facts that you all have raised this evening, matters that are in the public domain, that... There are real live issues that require attention. I think it's a, it's a noble step by those attorneys to do so. Yeah. Well, for me, the first thing about the motion is to understand its intent, its purpose. And, and, and Mr. Mr. Bihara, Senior Counsel, has correctly hit um, on a couple of those main intents and purpose. By now, um, many will be familiar that in our system of democracy, motions of no confidence are triggered by certain events. Events which lead people who are affected to become motivated to speak out. Mm -hmm. It is that process of speaking out that engenders debate, and that debate um, leads to a, a public exchange of ideas. I would say that it's fundamental to the proper function of, of a democracy. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. This discussion provides information and views that would inform on the topic many persons may not... Um, dispose themselves to reading on the on, on, on some of the information that we need to. And they would rely on this discussion to obtain certain facts, and they should. Because, I mean, look, this evening you have attorneys from across the profession giving their views. We are fortunate to have Mr. Biharila there, and we'll have other attorneys here. Um, you yourself, Kyle, and, and you, Stefan, you've practiced in this area of public law. You will have will lend your views to this matter. But what is the aim? In a very general sense, the aim is to really obtain a consensus on something. But in a specific um, circumstance, the aim in this particular motion is to canvas the representative body of attorneys throughout this um, Twin Island state and to get their, their views on the actions of attorney general in a very specific circumstance. Now, make mm -hmm. no mistake, this is not a general motion. It has to do with something very specific, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you took the time, both of you, to give the preamble and certain very important facts so people can understand what this discussion is about. The Attorney General is primarily an attorney, and as such, he is subject to, like you and me, um, the Legal Profession Act. In that act, as I'm sure you are aware, there is a code of ethics. Yeah. Um, this is a big paid schedule, and I, if you would permit me, I want to read a very short part sure. on the new rubric. It, it is just it is at the very first paragraph on a general guideline in relation to the profession and himself. And it goes like this. This is paragraph one. An attorney at law shall observe the rules of this code, maintain his integrity and the honor and dignity of the legal profession, and encourage other attorneys at law yeah. to act. Similarly, both in the practice of his profession and in his private life, shall refrain from conduct which is detrimental to the profession or which may tend to discredit it. Now, earlier, Mr. Biarilla, of senior counsel, was referencing how attorneys should behave, whether in private or in public. And that is important because you can, you can see from what I've just read, which is the code of ethics binding on all attorneys, and the real example that Mr. Biarilla has given, that there's an indelible expectation on all attorneys in respect of their conduct. Now, you all have stated very important facts, matters which are basically on the record and are important in considering the motion. The motion itself is very important for a number of reasons, but I will ask you to hear me only on one, yeah. and that is the question of perception. Yes. Now, you would be familiar. 
um, Stefan would have made this point to me already, that, that the question of perception is important to confidence, and public confidence in particular. Yeah. Perception is a heavy term. Yeah. And uh, of us are aware that with the, with the saying that justice must not only be done, it must be seen, seen to be done. Mm -hmm. And that really deals with the question of perception and, and, and ensuring that those stakeholders in respect of the system of justice have confidence in what we have. Yeah, yeah. The problem here, gentlemen, is the perception that has been created, undoubtedly, because of the facts that, that are available in the public domain. Yeah. As a member of the profession, I, and I am certain those lawyers who signed the petition, the requisition for the special general meeting, yeah. and countless others, because I know many persons have come to me and said, you know, didn't get a chance to sign. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of us are concerned by the perception that has been created by these recent events. Yeah, yep, yep. And that in and of itself gives reason for this motion coming by means of the special general meeting yeah. and to be discussed by the members of the profession so that we as a profession can speak in relation to the actions of, as Mr. Diallo has said, the most senior member of our profession. All right, let's start. Thank you very much for your contribution. Erudite yes, as usual. Um, well, Anand, I, there are two things he spoke about there which I think I would like to hear your comments on. The first thing I think he spoke about, the publishing of the names, and, and some people took that as an attempt to, I suppose, dissuade young lawyers, lawyers in general. Yeah. And I think when we were at the, like, the presentation of the Privy Council matter, mm -hmm. I think Mr. Marat said it well. Lawyers have a duty yeah. to society to speak out on issues. Mm -hmm. And they have to be, I mean, I remember reading an article by Lady Hale, a speech, Courage and the Law. A lawyer must also have courage to say the right things, to stand up for his client, to stand up even to judges, mm -hmm. and to sometimes stand up to his client yeah. when his client yeah. is being unreasonable. Mm -hmm. How important is that for an attorney in society and the role of attorneys as guardians of democracy? Uh, I would say that there's no greater responsibility okay. because one of the things <clears throat> that um, is often overlooked with all of the years a person spends going to law school, qualifying as an attorney, the hours mm -hmm. you spend studying, the financial commitment, not to mention a few, yeah. sometimes I know that there are many parents, in, in, including my own uh, uh, mother, who you know, was almost bankrupt in trying to make sure their child mm -hmm. um, succeeded in, in, in getting a profession. All of those things demonstrate a value in becoming an attorney at law. Mm. And that value is not having an attorney at law name on your shingle with your you know, uh, degree letters after your name. Yep. It is actually you are now vested with a knowledge that other people do not have with a qualification to speak on behalf of other people that is not available to the average citizen. Mm -hmm. And that if you do not speak, mm -hmm. it is akin to not pointing out when things are going wrong and undermining the rule of law yeah. in the country. Yeah. The rule of law is much more than a, a, a phrase. It speaks to the confidence in the judiciary. It speaks to the confidence for the criminal investigatory process. It mm -hmm. speaks to the integrity of those who speak in the courts and make representations. It speaks to the integrity of the legal office holders of any Commonwealth democracy. We're talking <coughs> about the Chief Justice, yeah. the Solicitor General, the Attorney General, mm -hmm. the DPP. Yeah. Yeah. These are people who, when they speak, we must be able to accept what they have said and not to question their motives, not to question whether what they're saying is accurate or true or, worse yet, if it's been misrepresented. Mm -hmm. There is no spin when it comes to the legal officers mm -hmm. of the state, you know, of the state or, or attorneys at law, law generally and that is well as yeah. and, and i think that's well as was touching on a more important uh, very importantly the perception yeah mm. i think we have the do we have another caller we have another caller yeah yeah 
Oh, oh Miss well, Ramajandi. No. As we are speaking about officers, officers of the state. Officers of the state, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, Miss Ramajan. Miss Ramajan, a prosecutor for many years. I have yeah. gone up against her personally. It's not. I, I, I think it's, it's, not, it's not very easy. <laughs> I think some years ago she may even. Have Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. <laughs> Ms. Ramajan, welcome. Thank you very much for having you. And I suppose... A regular on the show. Yeah, and we're going to bring you straight into that conversation. Yes. As an officer of the state, the Attorney General is a legal officer of the state. You acted as a prosecutor. How important is that duty of a lawyer to be fo forthright with the court? Especially a lawyer for the state. All lawyers, but especially that of the state. Because sometimes you may have information that, that other persons don't have. And, and how does it all play in this scenario that we're dealing with um, today? And what are your views on that? Well, I would probably want to best answer that question by quoting Leonard Senior himself, mm. the Attorney General. In the transcript, he referred to <laughs> ministers of justice being yes. officers of the state. <laughs> yes, yes. I cannot think of a person who sits in a more important position as an officer of the state mm -hmm. uh, than the Attorney General. Yes, mm -hmm. And every officer of the state, council as a whole, but even more so, an attorney with the state, you are required to be an officer of your word. Yeah. So much so as a prosecutor. If you have evidence that will throw down the entire case, you are obligated in law to make that evidence available to the other side and fold, yeah. withdraw the case. It could be because of the conduct of the police. It could be because of information that came through you. It could be because you found out the witness was lying. This is the duty that is required of you as counsel. And when you represent the state, your duty is tenfold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose generally in relation to this matter, what are your views on how it affects the profession? And, and what do you think about the, the motion and our opportunity on Friday or whenever, touch that. I think that the fact that this is in the public domain mm -hmm. is in and of itself an indictment on our profession. Mm -hmm. I think any senior attorney, regardless of the type of, of robe you wear, you have to hold yourself to your own moral and ethical code. And if you are the titular head of the bar and you are asked to account for something on an affidavit, and you attempt to minimize, distract, whatever words you wish to use, you deliberately, by your words and your signature on that affidavit, made statements contrary to what you actually did. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> there is no, there is no truth about it. There, it can only be two things. One, a genuine mistake, or a genuine effort lead. In either case, a moral code that is expected to be followed by counsel with what you ought to do. We should not need this meeting at all, in my respectful view. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else, um, Renuka, or, or you want to leave it there and save your fire I think, for Friday? I think, I think I've said enough already. I think you've said a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your perspective, um, Renuka, and, and I suppose we'll see you Friday. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care. Thank you, Renuka. Take care. Good night, gentlemen. Uh, you know, and I, I, I suppose she said it there, Minister of the State. I think you wanted to also discuss something about the publication well, of the yeah. names. The, the, the publication of the names is something that I find deeply troubling. And, and I say it's troubling for this reason. What was the purpose of releasing those names to the public? Mm -hmm. If the procedures have been properly followed, mm -hmm. remember the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago is a product of the Legal Profession Act, yeah. mm -hmm. an act of Parliament. The rules as to how it operates are set down. We yeah. all have to adhere to them. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Law Associ Association itself has to follow a certain number of rules. And if a motion is filed mm -hmm. and is carried with the requisite number of votes, uh, 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 that is something that you're following the normal procedure. Exactly. Yeah. What was the purpose then, if all of that was correct, in publishing the names? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I, of course... I am very concerned. I have to tell you, I, I, I know that others may have a view. I, I find that uh, to be deeply troubling. Yeah, I, no. Okay? You, and it should, and I, I would like to know 
who released those names. Yeah. Now I know you were you were around at the time of another motion. I don't yes. recall if the names yes the names were published in that one. I respected. I don't recall that they were. Yeah. And and you know I'm I'm sort of speaking now. It was another July. Yeah. When I was in Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> uh, in 2009, when there was a motion brought, when in fact Martin Daly was I think president. Yeah. Of okay. the Law Association. And um, it was a motion being brought, mm -hmm. uh, no confidence, in the Attorney General uh, at that time. I think it was John Jeremy, yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, and concerning a, a conflict then, the, um, uh, then Director of Public Prosecutions and so on. And I remember that, um, if I recall correctly, that Desmond Allam had made a very robust contribution. Yes. Uh, in, and Mr. in relation Guerra. to this, and Mr. and Mr. Guerra, and, yeah. and I think Mr. Khan, yes, uh, I as I recall, so. and I, I was much younger then than yes. than, than I am now, but um, I, I do recall it, and I recall the very same, the very same concerns that we're talking about now, mm -hmm. were the concerns that were discussed then. The person who holds this office has to be a person of the utmost integrity, yeah, and. If they are to conduct themselves in that way, mm -hmm. it gives confidence to the legal profession. It gives, gives confidence to the rule of law yeah, yeah. in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. And that where controversy like that is affiliated with the office holder, it, uh, it, it raises serious questions. And, and it affects all attorneys at law, yes. yeah, not I just, not yeah, just the person who may be criticized. But it's the kind of thing where we hear it all the time and, and we don't talk about the abuse that attorneys at law often get, where the public, because of misconceptions, yeah. because of reading what we're seeing in the press on yeah. this issue, they have less regard for us uh, and I suppose as attorneys. It's something that Mr. Acharya said, perception of... Absolutely. And then what Ms. Rambajan would have said, she doesn't even think that this issue should have reached as far because, it, it, of, because of the perception. Uh, Absolutely, and, and I think what Ms. Ms. Ramajan was uh, was getting at is that most uh, attorneys at law, confronted with the controversy, it's like the conflict of interest we were talking about yeah. earlier. Yeah. If we were confronted with a conflict of interest, and we genuinely couldn't now act. Mm -hmm. What we would say is, look, very sorry, client B, I cannot properly continue. Conflict of interest has arisen. To preserve my confidence to both of you, I am now going to withdraw from both cases or or one person's case because of information I have yeah. uh, in relation to another uh, because remember if you acquire information mm -hmm. in the conduct of one particular case and you then accept instructions in another case you may have obtained information from your first yeah. client which could be relevant in the second case yeah. and how are you going to resolve the confidence you ha off have to offer to both yeah. clients can you use the information you yeah. have or should you say look I rest of information cannot that use can, and, exactly. and, and and maybe the better thing for me to do is not to be involved because yeah, I cannot thing. represent the second client Correct. And I think We're that's generally the, the approach yeah. by attorneys so I um, think yeah. we I think we do have a, another I think that's the final thing yeah, yeah. The, let's see our, our good friend, Mr. Sobers, um, recent addition to the Section 1 contributors, yeah, but, right. but powerful as usual. Um, Sean, are you there? Hi, hi. Hi, Sean. How are you? Good, good. Peter Raman, and good night to all your viewers and to the panel. Yes. Um, it's a very hard of Queen's pleasure listening to the three of you this evening. Yeah. That um, first we coming too to late in, in the batting as well, too. I think <laughs> most of the the, the proper legal arguments and issues have been well well, by my, my well, well it's it's a limited over and we've now brought on our power hitter yeah I'll put it like that <laughs> um to, to get the run rate up um so sure i mean tell us you i mean you know it's it's no um it's no secret and i don't think it should be a secret that you are also um i suppose involved in the politics this yeah. is a matter and you know i, I hear people saying we want to keep the politics out of it but a proper political system allows an opposition party and any political party to raise pertinent issues yeah. in society. Correct. And this was raised, you know, quite rightfully mm -hmm. on a political platform. But that doesn't mean it's it to, to, to carry, a, you know, a taint or, yeah. or for a taint of politics. It is a, a serious issue. And I think it was properly raised. And so, Sean, give us your view. 
about this issue. Pull back. Give us your view about this issue. What do you, why do you think it's important to the population, both as an attorney at law and as a citizen and as someone involved in public life like you? Why is it important and why is it important that people come out and express their views on this matter? Well, the thing is, ultimately, um, as a member of the opposition, we have an extremely important role. To we are essentially the check and balance on the operations of the government, on all arms of the government and the state. And just like an attorneys at law, we are the voice for not only the persons who voted for the opposition, all members of, of, of Trinidad and Tobago, because the, the title that the opposition carries is not the opposition um, of the United National Congress. We are the opposition of, of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, as I mentioned before, I suspect that a lot of persons would have been hearing a lot of the, um, the legal jargon and the information being disseminated, not only tonight, but uh, for quite some time now, since this issue has properly well raised and brought into the public domain by the leader of the opposition, Mrs. Pesad Vicesto, Senior Counsel. Mm -hmm. um, but, but as recently as this morning, uh, an, an individual, a member of the public, not a lawyer, Lee person, inquired, you know, this man, seen all of this thing being paraded about, about this man, I'm one, I'm one, I'm one, I don't know what is going on, and I hear there's some vote and all the lawyers, and, you know, so, so they don't understand. I had an opportunity to, to really boil it down for him, and I think it's, it's, it, it was quite, um, quite, um, I was quite fortunate to do so, and I, I intend to do so tonight. You see, because I think in Trinbegonian culture, everybody that you speak to that is of a particular age or vintage, at least of, of an adult age or in, in their adolescence, they are well aware of what an, an affidavit is. I mean, yeah. Trinbegonian vernacular, they know about affidavit or affidavit, right? And they all know, all persons are well aware that that's a very serious document yeah. that you cannot... You can't fudge on, you can't lie on, you can't make any misrepresentation on at all. Yeah. And so, that when we as lawyers are preparing such documents, and we have to take instructions from a client to prepare a document like that, <clears throat> it is essential for us to, one, obviously procure the instructions of the client. Two, ensure that the affidavit mirrors the written instructions that we've procured. And then three, subsequently, have the client read the document over. And he or she, as well, too, is, is the final check and balance to ensure that the information that we've presented on that piece of paper mirrors the instruction to a T. Yeah. Because when you are before a court of law, and that affidavit, if it's in the form of a witness statement or whatever the case is, is being put in the video, a lawyer will ask the, 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 the person, well, listen, you visited your attorney's at law office. You presented certain instructions to him. He then prepared this document based upon your instructions. That document would have then been read over to you. You had an opportunity to read that document. And so that everything on that document, word for word, is true and correct. Yeah. I think that that's textbook cross-examination, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you give some young lawyers a, a, a lesson there. Yeah. Yeah, so no, but but then it's all for the for the population because yeah. they understand this I can't lie and this document is an affidavit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And so when you have someone in a position that the Honorable Attorney General is in, with all that has been said by Queen's Council and you guys here this evening, um, and then someone in his position who's also senior counsel mm -hmm. would more than be Okura, who would more than be intimate. Yeah. with the manner in which an affidavit is prepared, yeah. coming to tell the population respectfully anything on toward about how this operation has gone down, that he, that, that there may have been some type of misinformation or it appears to be some type of... It really holds no water whatsoever, that particular argument. Yeah, yeah. Because we all know, members of the public would know how important that document is and the processes and the gymnastics that have to be performed to ensure that document <clears throat> is, is properly well sealed, 
it is it is airtight and it definitely mirrors the instructions the person the the the, the deponent on the affidavit yeah yeah, yeah. All so right. that you know it's 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 it, it, it's extremely troubling then to hear the, the, the two versions being proffered by the honorable attorney general as it pertains to this thing called an affidavit yeah you know all right and um, i think um it is extremely important i i see in, in a document that is being um circulated that this is a motion of necessity i don't know who the authors of that are, but i took a read of it and it was well written well written right <laughs> Um, I think I said presented on your your show your show this evening as well. It was displayed on the show. Yes, yeah, it was displayed <laughs> right. on the show. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, well written. So it is in fact a motion of necessity, <laughs> and I think that all persons, all practicing attorneys at law who have that um, ability to to present themselves, whether virtually or in person, it should be their business to be there. Um, whether they voice uh, their opinions on the floor, um, that's one thing. But more importantly, that they cast their vote. Because this is, in fact, a motion of necessity that goes to the core of a principle that is not only connected specifically to the legal profession, but runs through the fabric of our <clears throat> society. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Well, you said, Sean, we, um, we, we left our power hit to, to yeah, come and yeah, be run with, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think you, you, you as jumped usual, as run As usual, you did your no, job. Well, 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 well. When you, when you, you see, when you fellas start off with, with, with Kyle and Steph one, and then you have someone in the form of Queen's Count. Oh, so number three. three. Oh, number yeah, three. Yeah, number like. three. The best match yeah, yeah, come here, yeah, number yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and, and your thanks for contributing, as usual. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, you always hear and you're going to hear arguments that oh, this is something political. And in my yeah. respectful view, one, you have a right to to support any political party of your of your choosing. Mm -hmm. That's a constitutional. Right. But two, mm -hmm. that's the proper rule of politics. I yeah. mean, we often get it bogged down in different things and back and all and talking. But the proper rule rule of politics is to encourage discussion on yeah. important issues. And whether something comes out on a political platform or not, let's be honest, it doesn't diminish something as no, important. No, and, and it affects, media. if you know it affects the profession, yeah. I think it's important. Should, yeah? Out, yeah. And um, my, my own feeling is that um, this goes beyond politics. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. sometimes it's easy to forget when politics is being played <coughs> out uh, in society that whoever forms the government of Trinidad and Tobago is not just the government of the people who voted for them. Yeah. Ah. They are the government of everybody. Yes. Yeah. And the Attorney General, we've talked about his position, he is supposed to be, in theory at least, akin to a judge, mm. independent, impartial, yeah. above the politics because of the important role he has to perform. And, and we see that role underscored in the... Um, Legal Profession Act itself, because one of the things we've, we, we haven't talked about in detail is, you know, why was this motion brought and what is the purpose of it? Well, I, I think we've covered it in general terms, mm -hmm. but ultimately what it comes to is this. If an attorney at law does something which, is, which breaches the code of ethics, for example, misleads a court, we would fully expect the judge to refer that lawyer to the Law Association, to the Disciplinary Committee. Mm -hmm. We would expect a member of the public who came across that <coughs> act to make a complaint to the Disciplinary Committee. But what people may not appreciate, they may say, well, why, why, why don't you make a complaint to the Disciplinary Committee then? Well, it's because the Attorney General is not subject to the Disciplinary Committee under the current procedures. Uh, set out in the Legal Profession Act. Mm -hmm. And so the only means by which one can, within the legal profession, call the Attorney General, if it's necessary, to account for conduct, is by motions like this. Yeah. It's a perfectly lawful <laughs> procedure. Once the requisite number of uh, uh, nominations or votes has been put forward to trigger a motion. Yeah. It has happened before. Mm -hmm. I hope it will never happen again, but it has happened in this instance, and it goes to an important issue. Confidence in the rule of law, confidence in the Attorney General as the ultimate upholder of the rule of law, and we should, as attorneys at law, be able to have confidence in whoever that person is, whatever our politics. Yeah. That's very important. 
Uh, and because he is not subject to the disciplinary committee while he holds the office of Attorney General, um, there, what other procedure is there to call the Attorney General mm -hmm. in the city yeah. mm -hmm. as uh, 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 the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago? And I think that it raises perhaps an uncomfortable um, reality that, uh, that we are going to have to confront. And I certainly think that it's a discussion that has to be had. Bearing in mind the Attorney General holds the position he does as titular head of the bar, I question whether that position should remain. Should it be now that the president of the Law Association should be the titular head of the bar, mm -hmm. elected, following correct procedures and so on, uh, uh, is that, has the time now come that that step should be taken to, mm -hmm. if you like, sever off the Attorney General yeah. as the so-called head of the legal profession? Because when things like this happen, it undermines yeah. all of us. Yes. And it doesn't set an example, I'm afraid, to younger people. Yeah. Well, I, I, well you, you've, you've <laughs> left us with a, a whole not, new thought. Yeah, not very often can I hear speechless. <laughs> but, um, it's left, left us with certainly yeah. food for thought. It's yeah. something probably we'll have to have an entirely a new, new program, program on. about yeah. uh, maybe before your holidays ended. Well, we're gonna we, we could we could close it off. We could close uh, it off. Can you have any um, f closing comments? You know, I, I I ultimately think to summarize, it's an important issue not only for attorneys at law. It's an important issue for all citizens of this country. I mean. All citizens can't come and contribute to the motion, yeah. but that's why you have lawyers, that's why you have a legal profession, yeah. and it is an important issue. We need to restore confidence in the public, even if that means simply coming together and discussing yeah. the issue and letting the public know that we've considered this issue mm -hmm. and we've taken a position in it, whatever yeah. that position is. Yeah. Yeah? Should be Ariel, any closing comments? Uh, After that well, I, 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 no, no, I, I wasn't intending to, <laughs> no, to, okay. to drop a bombshell, but um, <laughs> I think I think it's something that um, that we need to, uh, to to really reconcile. And I've I've made my observation. I think that the time has now come that we should look at the position of the Attorney General as head of our mm. honourable profession, mm -hmm. uh, as to whether that should remain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think anybody's expecting, uh, even if the motion of no confidence is passed, for the Attorney, uh, attorney General to resign. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a matter for the Prime Minister to consider and, yeah. and, and for the Honourable Attorney General himself to consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that um, we are trying to set an example for many attorneys at law in school right now as to how to conduct themselves both within and without the profession. Yeah. Some of those people in law school right now, in practice today, could become attorney general in the future. Yeah. What are we saying about ourselves if we as members of the prof profession do not demand the highest standards mm -hmm. of the highest lawyer in the land? Agreed. And that is what this motion, as I understand it, is about. Yeah. And I look forward to hearing about it on <laughs> Friday. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Yeah. So we could leave it there. I wouldn't follow Mr. Viharila. I wouldn't dare to, to try to follow him. But before we before we close off, um, I want to do some thank yous first because mm. um, this program was um, was drummed up Kyle, myself and the guys. We drummed it up very quickly, and mm. I want to thank the technical team, of course. Those guys there, they're looking a little sleepy in the back there, but but thanks so much, to you guys. I mean, excellent job as usual. Yeah. Um, very good. And we want to thank the the Secretary General. Um, Mr. Vijay Maharaj yeah. for accommodating us. Yes. Especially it's, it's two hours long in prime time television. Yeah, we always have right? to thank the Mahasabha and Jagrati yeah. and, and, and the management and, of Jagrati. And Vijay because, you know, first we had this lovely presentation on Privy Council versus CCJ. Yeah. And now we're tackling another important issue and it clearly <laughs> shows that the station, this organization, is tackling issues that affect the population. Yeah. 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 And I wanna thank I wanna thank all of the lawyers who joined us um today via telephone. And um, lastly, couldn't end the program without thanking Mr. Yeah. Of, no, of Queen's <laughs> I mean, of, of Queen's Council, because I mean, it's a privilege. I, I, we said it before; it's yeah. a privilege to have you here. We um, 
we took you away from your vacation. Um, on a lighter note, I think we should thank your wife for allowing that yes, to happen. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Because uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't very, know. I'm very grateful to Mrs. Bihari yeah. for, uh, for allowing me to be here. Yeah, I don't know how that conversation <laughs> went on our vacation, but we want to thank her on a lighter Excellent note. Excellent advocacy, yeah. I would say. <laughs> but, all of right. course, um, thank you, Anand, for being here. And um, and thank you all to the viewing audience and listeners at TV and Radio Jagrati. I also want to just put in thank you to, I understand we're also being streamed on Douglas politics yeah and mm -hmm. um archie and dogla politics thank you very much for also sharing this so yeah. that we could reach a wider audience a wide yeah and uh, so so thank you everyone we hope this is a very important issue and um and we hope that kyle myself mr bihari lal the queen's council have brought some clarity clarity to everyone mm -hmm. and that you understand what is going to happen on friday because it is a very important issue that affects not only lawyers but affects every single citizen i think in trinidad and tobago so um Let's, let's close it off, guys. Again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you on the next Section 1 program.